broadcasting on the BBC to all points unknown. If you're within the sound of my voice, you're listening to Welcome Home Podcast on the BBC. Hello and welcome home. Thank you for joining us on episode 70 of Welcome Home, a Disney Parks and Vacation Club podcast. I'm Tom. I'm here with Trevor. Trevor's back from vacation. We're so happy to have Trevor back. Uh, how, how was everything, Trevor? We're going to talk about it in a minute, but, uh, did everything, everything went well? Uh, yeah, it was, it was great. I'm not happy to be back, but we'll, we'll talk about it. (laughs) Tragical Express trip was a, you know, tough one. Yep. Yeah, it was, it was great though. We'll, we'll definitely go over it here in a minute. Yeah, that's great. And, uh, you know, those of you that, you know, listen to us, you know that, uh, Damon is currently at Disney World. So we, we don't have Damon with us today, but we do have a special guest, uh, podcast host with us. Uh, and this is Steve and I have been talking for quite a while. Uh, and, and Steve, you know, Steve, uh, has, I've been wanting to get you on the podcast for quite a while here. So we're, we're happy to have you. This, so, uh, this is Steve from, uh, the, uh, DCL podcast. So we actually have a, a Disney cruise line specialist, uh, on the podcast with us this episode. So, uh, Steve, if you could tell us a little bit about yourself, your podcast and, uh, you know, anything else you want us to know about your, your Disney fandom or your, your DVC knowledge, anything like that. Yeah, it's great to be on the show with the two of you. I've really, uh, it's been a lot of fun following you guys. And I want to thank you first off for, for putting together a DVC podcast because we joined DVC, let's see, 2015 out at Alani. And I could talk about that, I guess, a little bit, but, uh, it was, there just wasn't a lot out there about DVC. So I really want to thank you guys, the three of you for putting this together. It's been a lot of fun listening to it over, over the last couple of years. So I really appreciate that. But, uh, yeah, um, we run a podcast kind of like yours. We, it's the DCL podcast. It's kind of niche, I guess, cause we just cover, well, we cover Disney Cruise Line and Adventures by Disney every now and then we'll throw a different topic out there, like a run Disney topic or something like that. But kind of like you guys, uh, Christy and I kind of found each other and, and started the podcast probably about just about three years ago now. So usually we get a lot of trip reports. People like to come out and talk about their experiences sailing with Disney Cruise Line. And we just have a lot of fun kind of relaying those out there so people can kind of, just like you guys are trying to bring more information out to the general pop or to, to everybody out there listening about DVC. We're trying to do the same thing with Disney Cruise Line. So it's a lot of fun. You can find us over on Apple, Stitcher, wherever you can find podcasts, I guess. So, and DVC wise, we own at Alani and we added on at Copper Creek this last year, just a small contract at Copper Creek. So that's, that's kind of our DVC background. Awesome. Yeah, that's great. I, and I, you know, much like, you know, we, f- we fill a, a little niche for, for, for DVC and, and there's, there's a couple others that have, uh, you know, popped up like our friend Chad. Um, you know, you, I, I don't know if there's any other Disney Cruise Line podcasts out there. Not that I, I've seen anyway. Yeah, the, Scott over at the Disney Cruise Line blog, he kind of started the first one and he's probably got the like granddaddy website. He's, he's amazing. Does a great website for anybody looking for Disney Cruise Line information. Go to the DCLblog.com and he's got that out there. But yeah, nobody was really doing it. So we kind of jumped in and, uh, it's been a, just a lot of fun getting to kind of like you guys get to know a lot of our listeners out there, hear about their trips and just kind of learn from them and, and meet them along the way. We haven't, done quite the meetups that you guys have done but we're looking forward to doing that sometime soon in the future it, it's funny you say that because like so we've been following i, I want to say with bated breath trevor and i <laughs> uh because we you know we've been seeing messages coming from uh from our, our our listeners trying to find damon and damon is just meeting up with everybody at disney oh, yeah. world this trip he's a rock star <laughs> I, seriously, he's, he's been main, he's gone shopping with one family. He went on a, on rides with another family. <laughs> so yeah, it's pretty funny. I, I, you know, I, I think it's cool that he, his meeting up with all these people, but Trevor and I are just laughing because we're on the sidelines here. We're just seeing the messages and I'm just like, you know, the popcorn eating, you know, Jif, uh, <laughs> uh, of hoping that they meet up with everybody. So. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I think that's kind of the easiest part about just podcasting in general. You know, people kind of have this passion for whatever the topic is. You can go and listen to it and it's fun to actually meet up. It's funny because I actually met up with one of our listeners for the first time down at Disney World when I was down there a month and a half ago and we had just a good time down at Disney Springs for dinner. And then I met up with another guy that just have, I live in Portland, Oregon or outside of Portland, Oregon. And another guy just happened to be in town for a conference. So I met him two weeks ago for coffee. And then the next day I was up in Seattle doing some training for work. And one of the guys in my company that I work for 
he had been on our podcast, so I met him for coffee the next day too. So it was, it's, it's kind of a lot of fun getting to, to meet the people that listen to your show and, and talk to them. Oh yeah, definitely. I, I totally agree with that. Uh, we, we love, we love interacting with our listeners. I mean, Trevor and I at this point, and I think Damon too, are just amazed that anybody actually even listens to this. So, uh, so anybody we can meet that's crazy enough to listen to us, I, th- I think we, we want to do that. So I know you fall into that category, Steve, but, uh, we, we're not definitely not calling you crazy, but, um, <laughs> we just find it funny that anybody listens to, to us just talking about Disney and, and messing around like we do. <laughs> No, I think it's the same thing with us too, Christy and uh, our new co-host Chris. We, we just have a, we're just happy that well, just like you said, it, it's amazing that people listen to us and we love it. So we just appreciate each and every one of them. Absolutely, same here for sure. Uh, so th- thanks a lot, Steve. We we appreciate you being on, uh, and and we're we're happy to have you on. And, and one of these days, I'm going to do your show. But I do find it really funny that the two hosts you have on today with you are the two that haven't gone on a Disney cruise. And the one that has swears by Disney cruises isn't on, which is Damon. Uh, so I do find that funny that neither Trevor or I, or I have been on a Disney cruise, but that's, you know, it's in the plans. We're going to, we're going to do it someday. And, and maybe Trevor will convince, uh, convince his wife someday to go on one. But I, I actually think that the adventures by Disney would probably line up more with what we would do outside of going to the Disney park. So, yeah, there, there's definitely some overlap there. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, for sure. Well, so so this is great. We 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 uh we just got Trevor back though from Disney World. So I, obviously we want to hear all about Trevor's trip and and hear about all the all the fun stuff you did, Trevor. Because I it seemed like you you had a great time. Did you did you find any uh any, any of our listeners or did you not? Because I, I know a lot uh, several were looking for you, but yeah, sadly I I never got a chance to run into anybody. And uh, I mean, I was I was posting where I was going every day. And I know, uh, yeah, I know a couple of times people messaged that they were looking for us and, uh, it just, it didn't happen. But I also get it too because, um, the week that we went is the week before Thanksgiving. So, I, you know, a lot of people don't, uh, or there's not as many people traveling as there is this week, of course, with, with Damon being there. So. I get why it was a little bit harder to meet up with people, but I'm hoping that, uh, um, yeah, you know, you know, th- those of, those of you that were looking for me, maybe we can try again next year. We, we've already kind of started figuring this out as we're looking at the first week of October to, to be down there. And hopefully you'll actually be able to meet the three of us. And personally, I would really love to give away <laughs> the hats that I have because I carried them around with me all week, <laughs> hoping that I was going to meet somebody and, it just didn't happen, but, but that's all right. Um, as far as how the, uh, the trip went, um, I'm going to break it down by day because I, I feel like there, th- there was something every day that was kind of like, we, we, we actually ended up doing a lot, even though when I looked at my plans, I didn't feel like I had a lot on the roster. Um, it, it was, yeah, it, it, it was really packed full of stuff. And I think a lot of that had to do with the fact that, uh, my parents came with us and I knew that this was probably going to be the last time that my parents would actually go to Disney world because uh, they're, they're retired now and they want to travel like other places. So, so I knew that this trip was important just for, you know, giving them that last good theme park experience or, or as best as I could do. So, so the, the Sunday that we got there, we, uh, we ended up going to Magic Kingdom for most of the day. And, uh, a lot of our days we actually ended up doing split stays or not split stays, uh, split park days because of the Christmas party. So, so the Sunday was a Christmas party that we weren't going to. So we spent the majority of the day in Magic Kingdom and then, uh, headed to Epcot in the evening. Uh, one thing that, uh, and actually it's, I shouldn't say it's funny, but, but one thing that actually happened at the beginning of the trip was my wife, uh, hurt her shoulder and, um, it was, it was bad enough. Like she wasn't quite sure what had happened at first, but it was just, she, she moved the wrong way and she pulled something, but because she was having, um, all this pain, um, we actually ended up going to the, uh, the first aid center and then we act, and then, uh, we went to urgent care just to make sure that, uh, she didn't, uh, like seriously injure herself. Yeah. And that, that was a, uh, it it wasn't a planned experience, but I'm glad that we did it because now that I've done it, I'm, I understand a little better how the, uh, the care system works down there. And and I think this is relevant for people that don't, 
uh, you know, live in the States or like coming from out of country, it, it's kind of freaky when, you know, you go somewhere and it's like, well, you know, how do I get a doctor? How do I pay for this and all that? Uh, in my case, thankfully I had travel insurance and the, uh, when you, when you go to the Disney first aid center, they actually have pamphlets for all the nearby places that do urgent care and, and, and all that kind of stuff, because there's a few different private companies that do it. The one, uh, that I happened to, to go with, they actually even had a shuttle that came and picked us up from the resort and took us to the urgent care, which if you're not, I think they kind of realized that, you know, there's a lot of people that are down there that don't, you know, you, you don't go down there with a vehicle and you don't necessarily have an easy means of getting around to these places. So the fact that they offered a free shuttle to and from the, uh, the urgent care center was, uh, was super handy. So, so the, the way I would bet it, Trevor, a lot of people don't know that that's a thing that, that exists. Yeah. It, and and it, again, it wasn't like, I didn't even clue into it until we, until they, uh, um, we were at the urgent care and they gave us this pamphlet and, and they, they told me about it, but I, at the moment I was kind of panicked about, you know, Oh God, what do we do? Or how do I, you know, like I, I started phoning my, my travel insurance to figure out how to claim it and everything. And, but then I looked at it and they're like, Oh, you know, call this number and, uh, a shuttle will come pick you up. And, and they were great about it. It was, you know, it was a, a van came, picked us up, took us over there. Um, you know, we, we filled out all the paperwork, got in and out of there in, uh, in about two hours. So like pretty quick turnaround, I think for, I mean, I don't know how busy a Sunday normally would be, but, uh, that's not bad. I yeah. would say that's not bad. Yeah. So, so, you know, we got in and out of there. I, they, they build my insurance directly, which was nice. So I didn't have to pay out of pocket, which is another thing that can be freaky for, for those of us that are, are traveling out of country. And, uh, and we were able to, we went from Magic Kingdom to the urgent care. We came back and then we met up with, uh, my parents actually took my son to Epcot while we were doing all that because I, I didn't want to, like my son was worried about, about his mom, but, um, you know, we didn't want to completely derail his day because of it. And, and, you know, since my parents were there, they took him to Epcot and, uh, and then we met up with them. And, and so, so it was, it was an eventful first day, but, uh, you know, it, it seemed negative at the time, but when I look back on it now, I'm, I'm glad that we did it because the next time I'm, I won't freak out about it, I, I guess is the thing. Like I'm, I'm a little more prepared, which, uh, I always, um, count as a good thing. Yeah, you'll know what to expect. You know where to go, who to call. You know what what it's going to cost and all that stuff. Yeah, exactly. So, so yeah, we so so we got through that okay. Uh, the next day, we actually planned to spend. Uh, we spent the entire day at Epcot. So we uh, we went to Garden Grill for for lunch, and then we we attempted to go to Via Napoli for dinner. Um, the the mistake there was we had a, an eleven thirty at Garden Grill, which was fantastic. I like you know they they just as usual, I, I just find this one of my favorite meals and they knocked it out of the park again. My parents really loved it and, and it was just all around a great experience. And then the problem was, is by the time we got to, to dinner and, and I had made the, uh, the Via Napoli reservation fairly early. It was actually, uh, about five o'clock that I made the reservation. And I wish that I'd done it a couple hours later because none of us were really hungry when we got there. Oh no. And I, I don't know if you've ever, um, eaten at Via Napoli, but, um, we, the, their menu is a little misleading. Um, we, we read or we looked at the menu and they said, Oh, you know, a large pizza serves two to three people. So we figured, you know, between the five of us, we would order two large pizzas. These pizzas are massive. Like I, like, <laughs> Well, you know, Via Napoli is one of my favorites. That's what we go all the time. We yeah, go every time we go. Yeah. It, yeah. it was delicious. I mean, don't, They're don't huge. get me wrong. Yeah. It was good, but like we, we all had like a one slice of pizza and we were full. So we ended up, <laughs> we ended up throwing out some of the pizza, which I, I felt bad about, but we all agreed. We were like, you know, we can't, we can't eat this much food and then reasonably, um, reasonably continue on for the rest of the day. Like it, it would have, uh, it would have made for a very bad evening. And, and the thing was, is that we, we continued into the evening and we did get to watch Epcot forever. And we actually did end up fast passing Epcot forever. So we, we got to sit in the, uh, in the reserved area, kind of at the front of the, the world showcase there. And, uh, it was, it was a wonderful show for, for an in-between show. I thought it was great. They, I mean, you, when you, uh, 
when you know what was there for, um, for illuminations, like I, I talked to my parents about it because they hadn't seen illuminations in over 10 years, but they kind of remembered it and they said, you know, it, it, like I, I understand why they upgraded it and, and, you know, having those, the kites flying through it and, you know, the fireworks going off of the kites and everything. Um, they just, they thought it was wonderful and we, we really enjoyed it as well. I'm, I'll say though that now that we've seen it, I don't think that I necessarily need to go back and see it again. Cause, uh, also knowing that it's a temporary show, I, I think I could actually skip it with like, and that's not to, to, you know, downplay the show. Like I, I would say to anybody that hasn't seen it, you know, go and at least see it once. But I, I think I'm just going to kind of wait now to see what the next show is that comes from Epcot when they're done with all the, uh, all the improvements around there. So harmonious. Is that the, what it's? Yeah. Yeah. The, the, fi- the, the new show, the new permanent show is called harmonious harmonious. Okay, cool. Yeah. Steve, were you going to say something? I'm sorry. We, no, it's okay. I just got a quick question, Trevor. We're going to be down there in January. And do you think that we, we sat in the fast pass area there before for illuminations. Do you think you need to sit there for, for Epcot forever? Or is it kind of, can you see it? I, well, I know you can see it all the way around the lagoon, but do you, do you think you need to be in the front to see, I guess, to get a really good perspective of it? Uh, no, I didn't. I, I think you could watch it from anywhere. Um, it didn't like the, they, they really thought out how a lot of the effects worked that they, it wasn't exclusive to any one area. So, so they, they, they did realize that it's a full 360 degree show. And so we, we saw stuff in front of us, but you could see that like there was boats on the other side of the lagoon. And so, so you really could watch it from anywhere without too much issue. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. Cause you know, it's funny, Trevor, because I've seen a couple people in the Facebook groups, you're in all the same groups I am, saying how that it's an awful show. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, I don't think it was awful at all. I thought it was really kind of charming. It was it was very nostalgic Epcot. It like it had like, you know, all those old songs and like kids singing them. And I mean, listen, yeah. it wasn't like it's not gonna be illuminations. Of course it's not gonna be illuminations. I, I, I think anybody going in is gonna is expecting illuminations is gonna be sorely disappointed by it, right? I mean yeah, but, but it's, you should it's, go in and expect it for what it is, and that's an in between show, and and it was great for that. Yeah, it's it's still a good fireworks show, and you, and even I'll I'll take my my parents as a barometer of uh, the the non Disney fanatics take on it, I guess, <laughs> because because they're not as invested in this stuff as I am, and and you know you know for anybody going into it, they you know. Like you said, it is a good show. It, 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 it's, there's a lot going on there. There was a lot of moments in it that I heard my parents visit, like audibly ooing and awing at it. And I think that's a good sign of it, it, it's a worthwhile show to watch. And, and my only point on it is that, you know, I would watch it once. I wouldn't go back and see it again because I, I feel that I feel that I, I saw enough of it. And, and yeah, after, after you've seen the kites and everything, I, I don't think you need to repeat it. Yeah, I would agree with that. So, yeah. So, but, so you enjoyed Via Napoli though, after I've been talking about it on the show forever about how great it is. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> we, we agreed that, um, the next time we go, we, we probably, or not the next time we go, but probably after that, um, we're not going to eat at Via Napoli because we realized that, that scheduling, you know, a couple of big meals in a single day is a bad idea. Um, so, and, and I know via Napoli, you say, well, it's pizza, but like those pizzas are so huge, <laughs> but it, like they were so yeah, good. Uh, we had the they're pepperoni great. and the cheese and yeah, they were, they were phenomenal, but I felt really bad about, uh, you know, the waitress came back and we were like, okay, you know, we're done, you know, we'll get the bill. And she's like, well, I can box this up. And we're like, no, no, we're, we're good. <laughs> <laughs> I can't eat anymore. I can't even look at it anymore. <laughs> yeah. We, we just all agreed. We were, we were done at that point, which I, I felt bad about, but I'm glad that we at least did it because now, now we know what it is and, and we know what to expect. So, um, I'm, I will, I'll look forward to that in, in future trips for sure. And don't feel uh, so, bad, Trevor, because we did the exact same thing at the first time we went there. We didn't realize how big those pizzas were either. So you're not yeah, the I, only one, trust me. <laughs> okay. And maybe it's good that we're talking about it because, you know, in, in all of the, like I've watched videos of people going to Via Napoli and stuff like that. Nobody's actually mentioned how like a large pizza, they say serves two to three people. It's more like three to four people. 
I see, I, <laughs> like, and I've never noticed this before because when, whenever we go, my wife and I have very different tastes. So she likes to get like the pizza that has like the melon on it and like all sorts of weird stuff. And I just like straight pepperoni. So we always get the, the personal size ones, like, you know, the ones that are meant for one person. We never right. have done the big ones before. Yeah. And, and yeah, like I said, we, we figured between five of us, we could eat two of those, but no, like, I think because we were also partially full, you know, between the five of us, we could have shared one large and it would have been more than enough. So, uh, live and learn on that one. Yeah, (laughs) exactly. So, so moving on from that on to Tuesday. So Tuesday was our Hollywood studios day and we start off with, that was actually the only day that we did rope drop and it was purely for galaxy's edge because we wanted to get on smugglers run, which, uh, we got on it in, in about 35 minutes from rope drop. So not bad. Uh, yeah. So yeah, it was, it was pretty good. We, we got a good, you know, the, the line does the nice loop around the, uh, around the, the area. So you, you kind of get a good look at everything as you're waiting in line before you get on the ride. But then we spent the rest of the morning there. Um, I, I'm not, so I am going to skip over this for, for anyone listening. I'm not, I'm not going to talk about this too much because Damon and I are going to compare notes on this when he gets back. Um, so we'll talk about smugglers run in more detail on the next podcast. I will say that, uh, the, um, we had talked about this previously about the lightsaber building versus the droid building. I'm really glad that I did the droid building with my son and, the main reason for that is that I saw people afterwards walking around with the lightsabers and they're, you know, the, the, they look cool and everything, but my kid, um, he's been playing with this droid since he got it. Like, and he, like to the point where he was, he wouldn't let us put it in the luggage. He actually had to, to take it carry on onto the plane because he was worried that something was going to happen to it. <laughs> And, and he loves it. Like he, the, 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 the way that he went about building it, like the fact that, you know, it's just a whole bunch of parts coming down this conveyor belt. And he really like thought about how he wanted it to look. And I just kind of stood back and filmed him and, and let him go through it. And then, uh, so, so he, he picked out everything that he wanted. We went over and, uh, he started building everything at the build station. They had somebody there helping. So, so we actually had the legs put on incorrectly at first and so they came and, and explained to us what we did wrong and everything. And once we got it all together, um, it was, like I said, it's, it, it's a great little, um, experience. And, um, I don't want to spoil too much of it because, or well, I mean, it's like, like there, there's nothing like shocking that happens, but it, it, it's neat how they, like, they don't just make it like, you know, here you built a droid, you're done. They do, they do put some personality into it and they do like, even the people they're helping with it, it like, I, I think they realize that if, if they show it with some meaning that that resonates with, you know, the kids and the people building it as well. And, and because of that, I think my son actually kind of took it as, you know, he has his own R2 unit. Yeah. This, the, the same way that, you know, in, in the Star Wars shows, you know, there's, there's Chopper or R2D2 or whatever. He, he feels like he has his own R2 unit, which th- that to me is a very, it's a big thing. Like, like it's, it's a pretty, uh, it's a pretty substantial thing for them to to take something, uh, like, like just building a toy and give it that level of experience to it. And, and honestly, I think the next time we go back, I would even consider building another one because I kind of want to see how the BB, uh, the BB unit gets built. (laughs) Oh yeah. So he yeah. did an R2 unit. Is that what he? Yeah. Yeah. He, he just, des- he decided on the R2. He, he was going back and forth. And then when we got there, he was like, I'm building an R2, you know, I'm like, okay, fine. And, and, but yeah, like I said, next time I think we'll, I might try and convince him to build a BB unit. So I walked in there when we went to galaxy's edge and I, I, I the atmosphere in there is just very cool. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> just, it's, it's yeah. fun. Like just hanging out in there and kind of, honestly, all of the shops in there. So, so, so getting to like, our, our whole experience there, um, just wandering around the shops, not even necessarily like getting on the rides or anything. It's just a cool place to hang out. Like it's so like there's, there's things going on in the shops, like, like character, like there's animatronics in the shops. Um, oh, and, and yeah, like we, we kept running into, to, uh, to stormtroopers and, and, we saw Chewie and all that kind of stuff. Like, like it's just, yeah, they, they, they've really 
they've really stepped it up on just the overall experience of it. Um, oh, and we did try the, uh, I did get the blue and the green milk. Um, between the two, I like the blue milk better. Um, I think part of the reason I didn't like the green, the green milk wasn't like awful. Like I did drink it, but the color turned me off more than I realized it would. <laughs> <laughs> was it, was it the frozen milk at the time or cause no, I heard was, there's like two different types now, like in the yeah, summer the, it's frozen, right? Oh, okay. The, um, no, it, they just had the alcoholic and the non-alcoholic. So okay. we just, we just got the, the non-alcoholic so we could all share it. And yeah, um, it ended up being the, like we all, all of us tried it. And I ended up finishing the green milk because nobody else wanted it, <laughs> <laughs> and, which I understood. But the green milk is definitely not getting any love from all the podcasts I've heard. Yeah, it's it, flavor wise, the blue milk is definitely better, and I would I would go buy another blue milk. But we we never got a chance to because after we were done our droid building, um, the usually Tuesday would be our like pool day or break day because after a couple of days we know we want to take some downtime. Um, my son ended up, uh, he ended up actually calling it. He, he like, we were done in star Wars land and we had some fast passes later in the day for, uh, for toy story. But, uh, after we had lunch, he said he was, he was like, you know, I'm, I'm tired. I'm really not feeling it. And so we actually decided to leave and go back to the hotel via the Skyliner. So, so we got on the Skyliner, went to Epcot and then got on the monorail, went back to the, the hotel that way. Um, riding the Skyliner, it was, it was honestly wonderful. Like we were, we got there about like one thirty in the afternoon. So like middle of the day, it was, it, I mean, I guess it was hot by our standards and I guess for everybody else out there, you know, that, it, it, um, sorry, I, I'm not good at the, the Fahrenheit Celsius the con conversion, the conversion. It was, it was about, thing. yeah, it, it was about 24 degrees Celsius. So I guess in the eighties or something like that. That sounds um, right. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> and, and, uh, you know, we got on there and so, so from our, for our standard, you know, you know, here it's snowing and icing and everything. So it was, we considered the whole time we were there, it was hot, like, you know, hot enough that we were wearing shorts and stuff, which doesn't happen this time of year. Um, but we got on the Skyliner and it was, it was nice and comfortable. It was a great view. You know, we, we, uh, we took it from Hollywood Studios to Caribbean Beach and then got on the Caribbean Beach one going over to, uh, to Epcot. And, you know, we, I talked about with my parents the whole time and, and, and my wife and everything. And, and we all agreed that, you know, I, I would really like to see more of those. I would like to see more connectors between resorts and parks and stuff. And even, you know, even not necessarily directs between the parks, but kind of like how they have at Hollywood Studios to Epcot. You know, even if you have to hop to a resort and then from a resort back over, uh, I still felt, you know, I, I know we could have probably got on, uh, got on the boat and got there quicker, but I still felt because of the fact that you don't have to wait for a boat or wait for a, for a bus to arrive, it's, it's just a better means of, of getting around, I think. Like it, it's, it was so yeah. quick. <laughs> no, I totally agree with that. Like it's, it's so seamless to like make that transition. Like, cause at first you heard about that and you were like, Oh man, I got to get off and get back on again. But the way that they laid out that Caribbean beach station is so nice and, and it's so well put together. And like, you just don't wait because these things are so efficient and they're constantly moving. So there's like never a line for them. So you just get right back on again. It's, it's like, it's, it's not a big deal, you know? Yep. Yeah. And yeah, like I said, I, I, I give it a thumbs up. I, you know, anybody that wants to say, you know, try it in the summer. I even, we actually even ended up closing the windows at one point because, you know, the air was blowing through and my wife, you know, she just didn't want it or she didn't want it blowing her hair around or whatever. So we, we closed the vents, but there's still vents behind the chairs that are still cycling air. Even if you have the vents closed in the, like the, the upper vents closed. So as long as these things are moving, they're always cycling air. And even we did actually have our, uh, the one going to Epcot stop briefly for some reason. And I mean, we were only stopped for like two or three minutes, but it wasn't enough that you felt like, like it didn't get instantly hot inside of these things because there was still always airflow in them. So, so whether, whether you like it or not, you know, people saying, oh, you know, you could cook inside these things. Well, no, they're, they're still open on the bottom. So. I think it's kind of a psychological thing. I haven't actually written it yet, but I've seen them in action. But, you know, when when the lines continue to move and you see the Skyliners moving, I think there's kind of a psychological thing that makes it 
in my mind, seem a little bit better than waiting for a bus. And is it pretty quiet in there, Damon? I'm guessing it. I'm sorry. Is it pretty quiet in there, Trevor? I'm guessing it is. Oh yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, the, the, uh, the Skyliners themselves, uh, the, the carts, you know, they, they have a little speaker system going in there, but it's, you know, we, it was quiet enough, you know, we, we were having a conversation back and forth. You weren't having to like, it, like, like there's nothing mechanical in there really. So, so you don't, you don't hear a lot other than like when you hit the, uh, when you hit the post where it goes over the, the rollers, you hear a little bit of that, but. Right. I was just kind of thinking like with the buses, sometimes it's so crowded in there and they're kind of loud. And anyways, it just seems like a great way to travel with your family and kind of even have a conversation as you're cruising along and taking in the sights. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's way more private and way more convenient. I think it, I, I treat it the same as, you know, getting on any ride, like, like haunted mansion or whatever. The fact that it's a, a, an, an Omni mover like system, it's, uh, it's super convenient. Yeah. We, we found it downright like peaceful almost. Cause it's, it's, I was shocked by how silent it was. It is, it is almost completely silent in those things besides the little, you know, fun facts that the speaker is spitting out at you every couple minutes. But, um, you know, outside of that, I mean, we, we found it like just like straight up peaceful. It was quiet. It was calm. It was, it just, it just, it, it was very nice and, and quiet. I, that's what, that's how we saw it. But yeah. So yeah, like I said, I, I want to see more of them. Um, I'm with you, Trevor. I knew you'd be on board with this. I, I can't wait to see what Damon <laughs> says, but I, yeah. I, I'm, I'm totally with you. Bring, bring it on. Bring on some more. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. Well, ho- hopefully we'll start seeing more towers getting built here in the next year or two, but, uh, we'll wait and see. So, um, so continuing on. So, th- so that was Tuesday. Um, and, and yeah, so Tuesday evening, we, we went to Epcot. We stayed there for a little bit and then just went back to the hotel and, uh, and, Turned in early, mainly because, uh, like I said, because we got up early to go to Galaxy's Edge, we were, we were a little more tired than we expected. Uh, Wednesday was our, uh, Animal Kingdom day. So we, um, we got started not like right at rope drop, but we were there like maybe about 30 minutes after rope drop. And we also didn't go straight to Pandora because we, uh, I made fast passes for Expedition Everest, which I didn't need to, but it ended up working out. We ended up riding it like three or four times in a row. So, um, so that worked. I would totally do that because it's a different ride every time. So why not do it? Right. Yeah. And, and, and and the thing is we, we actually talked, uh, the one time that we got in, in line, um, we talked, or there was a lady that had actually been on it. Um, she had been on it four times by the time we had been on it twice. And she said, um, what she, or I guess this is for anybody going there is, you know, first thing in the morning, a lot of people go running over to Pandora, but if you have a fast pass already for flight of passage, don't, you don't need to book it first thing in the morning because that whole land is just crazy busy. Our fast pass wasn't until, uh, one o'clock. So we, uh, we, we were over at expedition or yeah, expedition Everest. It was super quiet over there. So we got to, you know, ride it a couple of times, and then, uh, once we were done that, we, we went over to Pandora and, and, uh, we got to see all the Christmas decorations over there. And I think it's really cool how they did it because, um, previously I'd, I like animal kingdom and never had decorations or not like the other parks do. I like that they, the way they decorate is, you know, it's very clearly, you know, people living in a colony just trying to, you know, celebrate Christmas. Like, like they didn't overdo it. And, and I think that's, I think that's a key thing for them doing that kind of stuff in, in those lands is that it, it did fit thematically with how you would think Christmas would look for people on another planet, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Like uh, they didn't just shove a Christmas tree in there and like make it work. Yeah. Right? I, <laughs> yeah. I, I think that the thing that made me laugh the most was, uh, the, so they have the mech over by the Satuli Canteen, the the big uh, the big robot, and they actually had they put a hat and a beard on him, like a like a Santa hat and a, and a beard. That's and funny. and it was like yeah, they made it out of stuff that they had on hand or whatever. So um, yeah, I, I really liked that. My parents, uh, you know, we we did flight of passage. My parents were completely blown away by it because they'd never seen anything like that before. Um. And, and so after we had done Pandora and everything, we, uh, we left Animal Kingdom that afternoon because we had a, uh, we had to get another dining reservation, but this time at the, uh, the storybook dining in, uh, Wilderness Lodge. So this is the, um, the Snow White, the Dwarves and the Evil Queen 
dinner. Formerly Artist Point. Yes. Um, so the food there was phenomenal. Um, even for, I have an 11 year old and he's not, he's not super adventurous with food, but they, they serve the, these, a couple of different appetizers. And, um, the one thing that stood out for us was they had this mushroom bisque that, um, we all thought was just delicious. Like I, I didn't think my kid was going to touch it. And then he had a spoonful and he was like, okay, I'm eating this. And he like, he downed it in like two seconds. So, um, and, and then, yeah, the food overall, like, like our, our main courses and the desserts and everything were fantastic. And the, the, the main reason we went there was, you know, my, my wife was actually the one who wanted to do the meet and greets because, you know, obviously my, my kid is not into snow white. Um, so he, he, he humored her in, in us going there, but it was clearly, you know, she wanted to go and get the pictures. The one thing that really stood out to me though is, uh, so you have the, you have the, some of the characters come around, but then you don't get to actually meet the evil queen until you're done the meal. So they give you a voucher where you go and you line up and you, you have a photo op with the queen. And she, like, that character I thought was the best. Like she's so, um, her attitude and everything is like, it, it, you know, whenever you've watched YouTube videos of people interacting with the queen, it was exactly that. Like, like she was, you know, kind of pushing and like, like threatening and all the stuff that you would expect from the evil queen. And we really enjoyed it. Like I, I, it was a big highlight of, uh, of character meets as far as this trip went. And we actually did quite a lot of unique character meets, but the queen did really stand out as uh one worthwhile. So, so for anyone that's thinking about going to, the storybook dining. Um, if, even if you're not super into snow white, because like in our family, we're not, um, or at least me and my son aren't, and my wife, you know, she, she wanted to meet snow white, but she was actually really more interested in meeting the evil queen. I do really think that that, that sit down is worth it for those interactions. So, I've- I've heard the theming of the restaurant is pretty amazing too. Like you're sitting in a forest and, and what? Oh yeah. Forever. Yeah. Yeah. Like the, yeah, the, 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 yeah, it, it, it looks very much like the, the seven dwarfs forest. There's all kinds of lighting and stuff that goes on at various points. And yeah, it's, it, it's, uh, it, it's a pretty, um, it, it's a pretty high end meal, I think, or as far as the meals that I had when we were there, it, it felt pretty high end. And, and I mean, price wise, it was, it was one of the more expensive ones too, but I feel it was worth it. Like I, you know, if, if somebody said, you know, chef Mickey or storybook dining, I would say absolutely storybook dining. So <laughs> yeah, it definitely seems a little, a lot more upscale than, than chef Mickey is right. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, I miss artist point, but I mean, I, I understand that artist point was like not the most popular restaurant. So it seems like they've, they've made an artist point, uh, you know, they made it a, a popular version of Artist Point by adding in characters, basically. It's still maintaining really good food, but then also having characters. Yeah, exactly. The, it's, yeah, the, I don't think they took away the, the food experience, but they did definitely add to it. And because of that now, obviously, it's a, it's a much busier place. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, keep that in mind too, is if you want to go there, definitely get your, get your reservations in early. Uh, so the, after we did that, we, uh, again, talking about, you know, our mistakes on Monday, you know, having a big meal and then another big meal, we, we did this, uh, the storybook dining, and then we actually had a dessert party set up for the evening. (laughs) (laughs) Um, but the, the main reason for that was because of the fact that it, it was the only night that I could get, uh, happily ever after dessert party. And I specifically wanted to do it because it was actually my, my gift to my, both of my parents for their birthdays because their, their birthdays are in November and December. So, okay. um, that so we sense. met them. At, yeah. So we met them at, at magic kingdom. Um, we, we were at least smart about it this time that, uh, you know, the, the, we, ate, the food, we, what I ate at storybook dining, I was actually thinking about, like, I didn't get anything overly crazy. Like I did keep it pretty light for, for dinner. So, so going to the uh, dessert party was, uh, we were a little more prepared for it. <laughs> um, but yeah, my, my parents loved that. The, the one thing that they had at the dessert party this time that I've actually never had at a dessert party was they had the, uh, the, uh, cheeseburger spring rolls. 
And th- that's oh. not been something that's been on the menu at the dessert parties in the past, but it was there this time. That, f- that feels like an odd thing to have at a dessert party. That's a savory thing. I mean, that's a, it is that's, that's but, weird, but I think the main reason for it is because those cheeseburger spring rolls, I've seen a lot of chatter about them on, on social media. Like people are like, you know, these usually you buy them at, uh, there's a cart in Adventureland where you go and buy them that sells spring rolls. And a lot of people rave about them. And I was like, okay, you know, whatever they're spring rolls. They are so good. <laughs> like I ended really? up, that, yeah. I had, it, it's a combination of the spring rolls and then the secret sauce that they have with them. I don't know what's in the secret sauce, but yeah, they, they were delicious. And I actually ended up going back and having two more, which, which I'm, I'm glad I did. And I, I didn't feel like, like <laughs> gross afterwards, but, uh, yeah, we, we, we kind of paced ourselves and were able to do the, uh, um, we did the dessert party. My parents, you know, loved it. They, they, they were surprised because we kind of like, I didn't tell them we were doing it and we just walked up and I was like, here's your bands. We're going to go do this. So, so they thought it was a great surprise and it was, it was all around a hit for the entire family. And, uh, and I, I think that was kind of a good wind up or a good warm up to how the uh, Christmas party was going to go, which was the next day on the Thursday. Our original plan was to go to Typhoon Lagoon and we actually ended up moving that to Friday because um, we all agreed by by that point we hadn't really had a break day, so we actually took uh, Thursday as just a pool day. So we uh, we just stayed at the resort until about we stayed there until about three o'clock or no, actually no, sorry, until about two because we uh, I did end up using the DVC early entrance to get into the party a bit earlier. Oh, nice. So yeah, so so we got there about. Uh, about, uh, it was about quarter to three. They did ask for my blue card. So anybody that is curious about it, you do have to have the blue card in order to, to use the early entry for the, the Halloween or the Christmas parties. Um, and because we got in early, we had lots of time to go around and do the, um, it, like, you know, do some rides. We had dinner and everything. And then we knew that the park was closing at six o'clock and, it, and this is also something to think about too, is if you're going to the Christmas party, that window between, uh, like if you can get there early, like uh, at two o'clock between two and six o'clock, the park does get really quiet. Like there was a lot of people leaving. There was a lot of people, you know, people that weren't attending the Christmas party, but then people that were actually going to the Christmas party didn't really start showing up until about six because the party didn't sh- start until seven. So you can actually get a lot done in that time frame between the, uh, um, in those couple of hours. And so, yeah, we, we did that. And then, um, we had agreed because, um, I know that like, like Damon's been talking about, uh, I, I guess now you can do uh, meet and greets with Santa at Hollywood studios and Epcot and stuff like that. Um, earlier on in the season though, none of those were available for us last week. Like, like I looked in my Disney experience and all that. And I don't think you can actually do Santa meets until around uh, Thanksgiving. Yeah. So, so if you do want to meet Santa and you're there earlier in November that we actually ended up, uh, we lined up so that we were like, we were like the second or third people to meet Santa that night. And, uh, best Santa ever though. Right. Oh yeah. He was, Santas are amazing. Yeah. He was fantastic. So yeah, we did that. Um, you know, we, we went around, like we, we hit up, uh, oh, we, we hit up, uh, Space Mountain. The, the holiday overlay of Space Mountain is bonkers. Like just in a good way. Like it, yeah, like it, it's, it's awesome. Like, it, like I, I was, I was laughing through it. Yeah, the, so the, the thing is, is usually Space Mountain is very dark and you can't see where you're going. They have Christmas lights going on in there. They have music and, and like, like just lights everywhere. Uh, to the point where it was so like, you can actually see the track. Like normally you can't see where you're going very well. It was very well lit up in there, which makes for a very, uh, a very different experience on your space mountain. But then with the music going and everything, um, yeah, it, we just thought it was great. And when we got off of it, because of all the lights, uh, I was seeing dots in front of my face for about 20 minutes. <laughs> so <laughs> 
Yeah. So yeah, it, that was worth it. Um, is that the first time that they've done that down at Walt Disney World as far as doing an overlay at Space Mountain? I think it is, isn't it? Yeah, it is actually. Yeah. So, so they, they've never done like Ghost Galaxy or Hyperspace Mountain or anything like that. So this was a, this was a new thing for them. I love the idea of the Christmas music and uh, the lights and everything like that. Cause I've been on Hyperspace Mountain and that's amazing with the Star Wars oh, yeah. music. So I can imagine what it's like with the Christmas music this time yeah. of year down it, there. So it, it's, it, it's, it's, it's everything like, like it, it's that I don't want to say cheesy Christmas, but like you know, just the the gaudy like lights and deck the halls blaring over speakers and all that stuff. Like it's it, if that's what you want, it's perfect. <laughs> it's over the top Christmas. <laughs> yeah, it is. It, it, it it's crazy over the top. Um, yeah, and then and then other things that we did at the party, we uh, we uh, we met like um, Tweedledee and Tweedledum. We met Goofy in a Santa costume. Um, yeah. So, so yeah, we got in a lot of great meet and greets. And as we were going around, you know, we hit up all the, you know, the eggnog and the cookies and all that kind of stuff. And then, um, we, we decided to, um, for watching the fireworks and watching the parade, I almost, I almost don't want to tell you guys where we were. <laughs> <laughs> that's right you said you you found like a really good secret location didn't you we did and and the thing is is if i if i say it i okay so all right i'll tell you guys what if i tell you know the podcast or you know all of our listeners out there about this spot you have to promise me you don't go telling your friends <laughs> <laughs> all right yeah i okay. think we can i think everyone in in their vehicles or, or or you know wherever else you're listening to us you know you can swear to the to to the podcast right now that you're not going to share this information. This is top secret. Yeah. So so we found that um one we did the later um Christmas parade so we didn't go to the earlier one. I don't know if this would work for the earlier one, but um so right out so from going from the hub towards Liberty Square, you go over the bridge into Liberty Square. Just off to the left there's a little it's actually the same area where you can meet Mary Poppins and Bert during the Christmas party or at least where they were for our Christmas party but there's like a little um area in there where there's like like benches and stuff behind the Christmas shop um we found just actually right next to the bridge they rope it off and there was nobody there like there were there was us and maybe like four or five other people but then further down in in Liberty Square, there was tons of people. The reason that this is a great place is that you get a great view of all the floats coming up and all the dancers and everything. So you, so you get a, a nice straight line that you can see everybody and you get front row seats. And then also because of the fact that the bridge is there, when they do the, uh, when the floats come up, they have to let the float in front of them clear the bridge before they cross. So you actually get a lot of the floats stopping like right in front of you. So you get an extended, look at at the floats and the dancers and everything for the party uh it also works for the fireworks because even though you're not looking straight at the castle the fireworks are pretty much right above you like like so close that i had ash on me when we were done so wow yeah it, so yeah it was it, it's a really great spot and i want to go back there again so please don't let too many people know about it <laughs> Steve, were you going to say something? Or, sorry, we jumped over here. No, 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 no. It's, it just sounds perfect for you to be there, Trevor. Next time you get, you get over there, there's probably going to be about a thousand people, there, right? Yeah, and, and, I'm, <laughs> and I'll know why. I'll, I'll admit. It. Yeah, I, I totally ruined it. But we'll all be thanking you for it. So yeah, well, yeah, you know, when, when you when you're there, Steve, you, you know where to go now. Like, like I said, the, it, it's weird that that whole space over by Liberty Square. It's like people just. It, people cut through there, but they don't stop there. So something to think about, I guess, whether it's, you know, for Halloween or Christmas or whatever, I would look at that spot in the future. Is it like that little, it's like a, is it right by like the, the Christmas shop there? That's it's that yeah. little area right over there. Yeah. It's that's what uh, we're talking about. Okay. I know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. You, it, it's like, it, it's across from sleepy hollow. So it's not like, it's not hidden or anything. It's just, yeah. I think just logistically, because of how people move through the park, nobody thinks to stop there. 
I think we need to rename it Trevor's Nook or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. If, if you want to get a plaque and put it on the bench there, by all means, I would uh... – <laughs> Just low key, like you know, stick yeah. something to the wall there. <laughs> yeah, to, yeah, let me know when you do that, Steve, and then uh, yeah, maybe I'll book another trip and <laughs> definitely. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. So so that that was Thursday, and then Friday, our last day was like I said, we we ended up going to Typhoon Lagoon. Um, that ended up being the greatest day to do Typhoon Lagoon because it was the hottest day we were there. Which again, you know, by our Canadian standards, it was like twenty six degrees. So. I know, I know to the Floridians, they thought we were crazy, but you know, no lineups in Typhoon Lagoon and, and it ended up being a good day for us to kind of relax and, you know, wind down a little bit at the end of the trip. And then we still, um, or, oh, the, so the other thing we ended up doing too that day was we ended up going to Epcot purely because we actually did manage to get into Epcot four times during the trip. And so that was our fourth visit there. So we got the annual pass holder coasters that we had been <laughs> trying to get. You've been eyeing up and yes. wanting. <laughs> yeah. So we, yeah, we got three sets of those, which uh, I'm, I'm happy about. I, I know they're just coasters, but they're annual pass holder coasters. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They're, yeah. They're, it's exclusive merch. Yeah. yeah I mean, and that's, exactly. that's free, right? So yeah. So that, yeah, that's about the, that's about the, the long and the short of my trip. I know we, we've been talking about this for a while here, but, uh, um, to sum it up, it was a fantastic trip and I, I'm doing up a video for it. I, I, as you guys have seen in the past, I like to kind of do a highlight video of my trips. Um, I, I'm just in the process of compiling and editing and all that kind of stuff. So hopefully you guys will, will see that in the next couple of weeks here, but, uh, all in all, you know, s glad we got to do everything that we got to do on this trip and I can't wait to see how the next one goes. <laughs> yeah, it sounds like you had an awesome yeah. trip, for sure. Hey, Trevor, I just got one question for you quick. With the droid building, did you have to make reservations ahead of time for that, or were you able to walk up and do that? So they, you can do walk-ups. So that they actually have two different lines. So that the walk-up line, there was a bunch of people in there, and it, it is subject to availability. So, so the reservations obviously get priority. And when we walked up, there was nobody in the reservation line. So we, we actually showed up about uh, 10 minutes early for our reservation. And I just said to the lady, you know, we're early and she's, and of course there was nobody in line. So she was just like, yeah, go. And, and we got in there right away, but you can do walk-ups as well. Okay, you just perfect. end up having to wait a bit. Perfect. Thanks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. All right. So, um, with all of that said, uh, we should probably talk about some DBC news, shouldn't we? Yeah, I'm always thinking maybe we should do our ad here since we're probably about halfway through and then we oh, can yeah. talk about all the other stuff we're going to talk about, right? All right, let's do it. <laughs> all right, cool. So uh, this is for our friends over at a DVC Rental Store. Are you a frequent Disney visitor and want to save hundreds, even thousands on your next Disney trip? The DVC Rental Store wants to help you book your dream vacation for less. DVC members, it's great news for you too. Want to rent your points out for some quick cash? DVC Rental Store wants to work with you, and they are currently renting out points at a record pace. For years, DVC Rental Store has been helping guests stay at deluxe resorts at an affordable price, while also paying members the highest price for their points. So if you want to learn more, you want go to dvcrentalstore.com or call 1-855-DVC-RENT. That's 1-855-382-7368. Of course, most importantly, tell them that Welcome Home sent you. Uh, we want uh, them to know that uh, Welcome Home is, is uh, where you heard about this great company and, uh, and their great service and the ability to uh, either rent out your points if you don't have points or, uh, you know, I mean, if you uh, need to rent out your points or uh, renting points, if, you know, maybe you're thinking about DVC or just want to save some money on your next vacation. That's, that's a great way to do it too. So uh, check out DVC Rent store they're a great partner to our show and have been uh for for quite a while now uh we we really uh like them as a company and uh, they do a great job so uh again that's dvcrentalstore.com 1855dvcrent uh to find out more information about renting out your points or uh, renting points for a future vacation so thanks a lot to dvc rental store for uh, being a sponsor of the show we really appreciate them yeah absolutely yeah so let's, let's talk, uh, let's, there's some DVC news out there. And, it, and actually we found out, uh, just talking to Steve, Steve is a West Coast Disneyland guy. So, um, so this is a perfect conversation for you, Steve. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Kinda, <laughs> we we kind of like to think that Disneyland is our home resort. 
<laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, and it sure. can even be your home resort even more if this happens, what we're going to talk about right now, right? Yeah, I'm pretty excited about this. So. Yeah. Well, let's, let's hope it happens, but we'll talk about that in a second. <laughs> so, um, news came out that, uh, 350, uh, new DVC rooms are, are being proposed for Disneyland. Um, so Disney, uh, D- a DVC submitted a proposal to the city of Anaheim to con- construct a 12 story time, ser- timeshare facility next to the Disneyland hotel. Um, and so this happened just, uh, just a week or two ago here, actually really just like a week ago, uh, for the city to review. Um, so it would contain 350 DVC villas, uh, and it would look like the, the Disneyland hotel. Um, and so the reason, you know, this is, if this does happen, this will be, you know, a lot of construction jobs and also, you know, more DVC jobs, but this is like sorely needed, right? For, for Disneyland. I mean, Disneyland right now just has Grand California, which has like literally 48 units. I'm not making that up. It really has only 48 units of TV for DVC at uh, Grand Californian. And so, um, you know, this is something I think people have been asking for for a long time. I just have some skepticism because I know that Disney land and the city of Anaheim are not on the best terms lately. And um, I know there's been some restrictions around uh, just the, the timeshare uh, code that they have for the city. And, and I know I, I, from last I heard DVC didn't even have 350 available slots, uh, but based on like the, um, the, uh, uh, the local codes around timeshare. So I don't know if they have to change some things for this to happen, but I'm going to be interested to see if this actually goes through. I, I've seen a lot of sites reporting this as like, it's a done deal. It's going to happen, but this still has to get approved by Anaheim. And that is not a sure thing. Well, I think one of the things that I've heard, at least out here talking to some of the people is that they, unlike the four star hotel that they were proposing to build, which was going to be Next to the Disneyland Hotel, they are not asking for tax breaks from the city of Anaheim this time where, and I think that got to be kind of controversial back and forth there. So I think that just some of the, the way they're approaching it, and I don't know the in and outs of maybe some specific timeshare laws that they may have within Orange County down there, but, uh, it just seems like they're taking a different tact with the city here. So I'm kind of hoping that with that, it's going to kind of help kind of push this through. Yeah. And, and I think the thing is too, is like you said, the, the whole, um, the whole back and forth between Anaheim and, and Disney on this, um, you know, Anaheim definitely, they try to, you know, assert themselves, I guess, with Disney that, you know, they don't want to put all their eggs in one basket with Disney, but I think they're also smart enough to know that, you know, completely ghosting Disney and ignoring anything that they want to do is just as bad because like, yeah, if, if they don't let Disney expand and if they don't let these things happen, um, I mean, I don't, I can't see, you know, Disneyland shutting down, but it will, it will definitely affect things. And I'm sure that they're, they're aware of, you know, Disney obviously has a lot more control over in Florida, but I'm sure Anaheim is aware of the fact that, you know, that, that could potentially draw tourism away from them if they're not careful about it, because people will figure out after a while, well, you know, there's, you know, there's nowhere to stay or there's no DVC in California. So, you know, we're going to go East coast and spend our money. So yeah, ho- hopefully there's enough incentive here for, for Anaheim to at least play ball with Disney on this one. And yeah, Selfish side of me says I want more DVC rooms there so I could, you know, possibly maybe move my contract or one of my contracts over there. <laughs> well, yeah. And that's, and that's the, that's the whole thing. Steve brought off a good point there. You know, it's, it, 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 they're not asking for tax breaks this time around. Right. And so that was a controversial thing at the time is, you know, Disney, this, you know, corporation that makes billions of dollars asking for, for tax breaks. I mean, it's a common thing. It's not like it's a, you know, something that doesn't happen all the time, but, uh, you know, that, that project was, you know, it, there was a new city council at that point and they were, I think they were kind of both testing their boundaries and, and things just kind of fell apart there. Right. Um, I would hope it seems like they've made amends somewhat. Uh, I, I think there was Disney was sponsoring some sort of community housing project, uh, in Anaheim that I think was a uh, kind of like an olive branch. Um, but, I, I'm, I'm hopeful, like you said, I mean, this is, Anaheim knows that their, their, their biggest source of jobs for their, their residents is probably Disneyland and tourism. And because of, uh, you know, because of Disneyland being there and, and uh, they make a ton of money off of Disneyland being there and, and having a new 350, uh, you know, DVC, uh, room of resort, 
uh, in, in Disneyland is nothing but a positive for, for Anaheim as a city. I mean, that's, that's a, gonna bring more people there and, and going to bring more, and it's gonna sound really bad, but I'm gonna say it anyway. Um, you, when you're talking DVC people, you're talking about, uh, you know, in general, people that have maybe a little bit more money, uh, you know, cause it, it is an expensive investment. Um, and, and also people that are willing to spend more because, you know, DVC people are going every year or, you know, going constantly to Disney parks. Um, so they're, they're spending their money at Disney more often, you know, than, than anywhere else. So, uh, I, I think, I think it's, it, it's a great target, uh, you know, for, for, you know, Disney to go after, obviously, but, um, I think Anaheim should be, look at this and go, we're going to have, you know, some really great tourists coming here that are going to spend a lot of money in the area and going to spend a lot of money in the city, uh, and, and also, you know, employ a lot of our people too. And just from a DVC perspective, for all of us out here on the West Coast, you know, it's, and you guys know, it's so hard to get into Grand California. And oh, we, yeah. we've, only, <laughs> we've only, I think we've had two stays where we've gotten maybe one or two nights and it's always been in a wood bedroom because it's just about impossible to get a studio if you're looking for something smaller. So I just can't imagine this not selling out. And there's just, like I said, there's a, there's a lot of us out here on the West Coast that, it's it's kind of a trek to make it all the way to Florida all the time. So if we could pop down to Disneyland and use our points down there or invest down there, I just can't see how this wouldn't be a win. Now, so when when you do use your points, do you actually like sometimes like rent your points out and then stay on cash, or or do you just always try to get in at the uh, the actual DVC rooms? Um, we have you know the one thing that I haven't thought of doing before was actually using our points at the Disneyland hotel, which is not necessarily the best use or the cheapest use, but because you can never get in, you can always get into the Disneyland hotel with your points. It seems like, but not in the grand Cal, but to, to answer your question, Trevor, no, we, my parents live over in Hawaii. So we use most of our points generally over in Hawaii. And then uh, this year we're actually going out to Hilton head for spring break. So uh, we end up using all our points. So when we have stayed there, if we can't get in on our points, then, uh, I'll just say that I'm, I'm retired military, so we can get a pretty good discount with uh, military pricing on the hotels. So that's the only reason why we can stay there on oh, cash. Sure. Cool. Well, that, that's that sounds like a great uh, a great scenario for you. For me, it's always been I, I've always just stayed at the Grand Cali on cash because yeah, the, forget getting the rooms. <laughs> yeah, it's just about impossible, isn't it? Like yeah. I said, we've only stayed there twice with points. So, I mean, with so few rooms, it's 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 really difficult unless you have points there to to get a room. I mean, it just is. It just, you know, supply and demand, right? Yeah. And have you if either of you guys you guys have wandered through the Disneyland hotel if you haven't stayed there, right? Uh, I've, I've only never been, been to Disneyland, so that's Oh, I'm sorry. Question. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I've only I've I've gone into the lobby briefly, but yeah, we didn't uh like I didn't spend a lot of time in the Disneyland hotel. Yeah, and I think it's people love it so much just because of the history and and the history around it, and just kind of I'm gonna use I use this word is kind of gonna sound kind of corny, but the whimsy of the hotel, like when you walk in the mm-hmm. lobby and they've got the the teacup seats there in front of the the check in desk and everything. There's just something about it that you just don't find at any of the other DVC resort or Disney resorts that we stayed at. You know, they all have their own character, and I, I think it's kind of got a special feel to it. So if they can kind of incorporate that into that, that fourth tower, I think it's going to be pretty amazing, especially with all the history and stuff behind. If you're interested in the history, history of Disney and Disneyland, I think it's, it's kind of really cool. Yeah. I think, I think that the way my wife would put it is that it's Walt. <laughs> she yeah. like, it, it, I, I know what you mean is that, yeah, that the hotel really feels like it, it's Walt's legacy yeah it's hard to put you know, with all the pictures and they've got the like the original car there when you go by steakhouse 55 from the why can i say it now the oh geez autopia ride i yeah. mean it's, there's just so much so much history around it that you, you just get that feel like you said of walt which uh, that's a great way of putting it mm-hmm. yeah so the, <laughs> even if this does get approved i should point this out this is still quite a ways off it, we're, we're talking 2022 uh at the earliest but I, I do want to ask both of you as being, you know, I mean, Trevor, you're not necessarily West Coast guy, but you kind of are because you were a Disneyland guy, right? So it, if this gets built and, you know, assuming let's say, let's say it has around the same direct price point as Riviera does, you know, maybe in the one eighties, right? Um, is this a no brainer for you guys? Like to, to buy into this resort? Uh, go ahead. 
Steve? Yeah, I, I mean, for us, I think it really is. Because one thing that I wasn't really thinking about initially is, well, the first thing I thought of was like what you're talking about, Tom, is just, boy, what is the cost going to be by the time it gets to 2022? And, and are we going to be able to afford it? But uh, something that somebody else kind of mentioned that I didn't really think about is, you know, Disneyland – it's, you know, three or four days down there is just about perfect for our family. You know, three days is perfect. So you may not need quite as many points that you might need to do a Walt Disney World vacation. Uh, does that make sense at all? That makes yes, sense. Absolutely. So it might be a little yeah. bit, it may be a case where, you know, you don't really need, it depends upon how you travel, obviously, and everybody travels differently. But maybe, you know, to do that Disneyland vacation, if you're just popping down there once or twice a year like we do, generally just once a year, you know, you may not need as many points as you think you may, or you may need to do those week long vacations to take in everything at Walt Disney world. So uh, I think it might be uh, it for us. It's a no brainer. We're definitely going to look into it and plan on it right now. Trevor. Yeah. For, for us, um, because of the fact, yeah, we're, we're kind of in the, I shouldn't say the middle. We're actually, yeah, closer to West coast, but the, the logistics of going to, uh, Florida versus California. It's, you know, we save ourselves a couple of hours travel time going to California. Um, it, if I was to look at this, I think we would, I have a small, that smaller resale contract at, uh, the Polynesian. I would actually possibly look at, um, kind of to what you're saying, Steve is, you know, just going with a smaller contract there just to be able to do the 11th month booking. And yeah, I, I agree. I, I would probably say, you know, I can do five days there easily, but it's really just, you know, some of those days are just sitting around just saying I'm in Disneyland. It's not that I'm like, it, it's not the same as a Florida trip where it's like every day is, is something different in a different park and all that. It's, it's a lot more relaxed trip. So yeah, I don't, I don't see the need to have the same amount of points that I would have going to, uh, going to something on the East coast. But I would, I would definitely be looking into it. I, I think that it's just a discussion for how we plan to travel in the next couple of years. If we do decide we want to, you know, maybe one year we do Florida, one year we do California. Yeah, I, I think that definitely changes the math a little bit, right? I, I mean, I, I don't know if I would look at buying into it, but I would definitely, I mean, I would definitely want to stay there. I, I, I prefer to stay in my DVC bubble, you know. <laughs> so. Mm-hmm. Uh, so if, if I can do that, you know, and I, I really can't, I, I could try to get into Grand California, but like we're talking about, it's very hard to do. So, uh, so yeah. So I, anything else about this before we, we move on to the next thing, which is a really cool topic that I really want to talk about. Let's, let's move on. Cause I think we all want to talk about it. <laughs> yeah. You go, you go ahead. You let's, let's, you can yeah. talk about this one. Trevor started off. <laughs> yeah. All right. So, uh, so, uh, for the opening of rise of the resistance, Disney is planning to fly X-wing drones, over Galaxy's Edge during the press event. So according to some sources, uh, backed by some photos that uh, hopefully we'll have some have these up when the podcast goes live, Disney is testing two SUV-sized X-Wing drones to fly over Star Wars Galaxy's Edge. Those are some big drones. Like, when did they stop being drones, I guess? Is it... When did they got, stop being drones and start being planes? <laughs> yeah. Like, like, do they have... Is it just because it doesn't have a pilot or... <laughs> Well, I'm, I'm kind of thinking like SUV size. That's like the size of a predator, like those military drones that they use that fly all, all the way over the world. So I mean, right. that's, that's a big drone. Yeah. It's huge. <laughs> but it's yeah, an X-wing. I mean, <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> I, I mean, I, the pictures of it are at night are insanely cool looking. I mean, it looks like a real X-wing flying by. Yeah, like I, the only thing that makes me sad, you know, I, I I'll definitely want to see the videos of this. I'm just uh I I understand why they would only want to use them for uh for press release stuff. But man, could you imagine if they had this as part of a fireworks show or something like that? Yeah, I mean, I that's the thing. I I'm bothered by this a little bit because why are they just doing this for a press event, right? This should be, I feel like this should just, like you said, a fireworks thing or should be a nightly event where they just fly by, right? What is more immersive than that? You're on a different planet and you just see some X wings randomly fly by in the sky. I mean, I feel like this is, this is like the things that they promised us the galaxy's edge would be with like the droids wandering around and the characters wandering around the things that we haven't really seen yet. 
uh, you know, we, we haven't really, we've seen, you know, Chewy and stuff like that, but we haven't seen like full costumed aliens walking around and, and droids just free roaming around. That's not something that's happened yet. Now, given the land is technically not fully open, right? So it, it will be fully open in a week here. Um, but I, I'm just disappointed by this because I, I think this would be cool to just see flying by on a nightly basis. Now, and maybe that's not feasible because these are gigantic SUV sized drones that are not, you know, I don't, I don't know what kind of maintenance they require or, you know, how how reliable they are or, or how much they cost to maintain. But I just think that would be such a cool piece of the ambiance to have that, you know? So the one thing I'm kind of wondering with the press event is will they kind of control where everybody is in that press event a little bit more so that they actually have space for them to make sure that they're flying in a space where it, they're actually not flying over people, I guess. Does that make sense what I'm saying? Yeah, that that's a good point. I, I was thinking about that too is, you know, I, I don't know if it's necessarily going to be directly overhead, but yeah, it might be, that, you know, that they fly over an area that's blocked off because uh, I guess the logistics of these is it's a car in, in the air. Right. And, you know, looking at Hollywood studios and the surrounding area, there, there's roads, there's like, like the, these things aren't just flying over galaxy's edge. They're flying like the, there's a lot of airspace there. And I guess the concern with that is kind of to what you're saying, Thomas, you know, what happens if these things fail for whatever reason, and you suddenly have a car falling out of the sky, either (laughs) onto the road or onto, or into, you know, a park or another car. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Well, that's from what I've seen, it looks like they're, they're launching these from a cast member parking lot that they've cleared out. Um, so like they've cleared out a whole section of a cast member parking lot and I'm guessing that it's going to fly over the backstage area of galaxy's edge, like over the show buildings. So, but it'll look pretty close because of, you know, the way that they, the perspective of everything, but, um, that's just my guess. I I'm assuming that they are, wouldn't, I don't, I, I'm assuming the FAA wouldn't allow them to fly these things over spots where people are. I would guess. Yeah. <laughs> yeah but, I, you know, I, I don't know. I, I think so too. I, I just it, it, kind of the same thing as um, for the Christmas party. I, I didn't realize this is that they actually, uh, they closed some of the roads around magic kingdom because of the fireworks. So if that's just for fireworks that they're closing roads off, having these, yeah, the, the, wherever they fly these drones, it would have to be in a very controlled space, which makes me sad, but <laughs> Well, it's, it's kind of like, remember when they did the thing over at Disney Springs that one year where they had the lights to the Christmas music, they had the drones kind of flying to it. So it was all out over the lake, right? Over, yeah. over that lake area. So I think they could probably do the same thing with these. And, and maybe like you guys are saying, it's just going to be a test event initially with the, for the, oh man, I'm totally Rise of the Resistance. Event. Yeah. For, <laughs> for the opening of Rise of Resistance for the press, press event. Yeah. But, but, the hope I think would be that at some point they kind of incorporate into some, maybe not a nightly show, but some kind of show that you, you can kind of plan on going down and seeing at certain times during the year. Yeah. And that's a good point. This could, I mean, this could feasibly be a test, right? Uh, this could be just them trying to see how this goes. And I mean, although the, the, the whole thing that you're talking about at Disney Springs a couple of years ago, while very cool, I'm, I was kind of surprised they didn't do it again or expand on it and continue that. Uh, cause they, they filed a lot of patents over the past couple of years around drones. Um, and I know they've gotten some, some, uh, permissions from the FAA to fly some of these drones in, you know, near guests. Um, I, I, I actually have an expectation that the new illuminations, you know, the illuminations replacement, uh, harmonious will include some drones. Um, but I, I, you know, I don't have any source on that. I'm just, saying that i'm just guessing that but in my mind i would maybe this is a, just a test and and we'll see how well this plays on social media because i'm sure this is going to blow up on social media it's going to get shared by all these blogs and all these different websites and this is going to be a huge thing on social media and I, I maybe it's just a test balloon for you know them trying to see how this is going to go and and maybe they'll continue it somehow i don't know yeah i i think I think not even necessarily the social media response, but I think there's going to be stuff in the back end on this too, where, you know, they're, they're going to be figuring out logistically whether this is feasible or not. And I think a lot of it's going to have to do with if, if things go well from like how they pilot them or how the drones behave during the press event, I think that'll drive whether we see more of this kind of stuff or not. 
Yeah, definitely Trevor. And I'm going to go on a weird segue. I went to a New York Knicks game about two years ago, Mm -hmm. and the opening before the the game actually started, they had the dancers come out, and they turned the lights down, and each one of the dancers had kind of like some kind of like light up stuff in their uniforms. So they're dancing and you could see them moving around. And at some point drones popped up. So all you saw was this like circle of lights moving to music down in the middle of the basketball arena. And they did that nightly, I know two years ago for the Knicks. So if they can do it, I think Disney can figure out a way to do this and really make it cool. Yeah, I agree. It's just, I guess it just matters whether they want to or not. That's (laughs) that's a good point there. (laughs) Yeah. Don't, don't, don't pull up my heartstrings with SUV sized X wings and then take them away. Yeah. Those pictures are amazing. Aren't they? <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, that's just that sentence right there. just makes you want to go. Right. I mean, yeah. yeah. I want, I want to see these things. And, and actually, so the other thing about this article too, that the, this, these X wings are totally overshadowing it, but during the press releases, there's also going to be, I guess in Disneyland, there's going to be a stunt show going on. And in Disney World, they're going to have a walk around Hondo Anaka during the uh, media events. So, are those, is that, are, I, I I was trying to remember if those. In, I got to look at the article again. But were those things that already happened, or things that are going to happen? Those are going to happen during the media event for Rise of the Resistance. So, see, this is but the, see, these are the things we expected to happen just as a land for Galaxy's Edge, though, right? Like this to have those walk around characters like that, and just have people randomly fighting. Like, why are they only doing this for the media, and not just in general? I think you may have just answered your own question. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I get that, but like, I get like the idea of what publicizing this and making it seem exciting. But like, I, I don't know if I, if I read a blog and they were talking about like a cool, like fake fight that was happening, like I would want to go to Galaxy's Edge and see that fight and be kind of bummed if I didn't see it. Right. And, and that's the point of this is I, I think kind of like you said, they're not fully open yet. I think they may have been holding back on a lot of this stuff so that they can kind of do the grand you know, show of it. Yeah. And then you'll start seeing it more in the future. I would agree with that. I, I do think that they've held back on like the droids and the, and the costume characters and all that until the land is fully open. Cause I, it feels like it's been forever, right? Like that, that, that this land quote open, but it's really only ever been half open. It's, it's missing the, the main attraction there. And, and that's no offense to smugglers run. I mean, it's from everything we've seen of rise of the resistance is going to be the, the, you know, the e-ticket attraction there. Um, so, you know, and, and Smuggler's Run is, is, is great. And I, I know you're going to talk, you'll give your review when, when you get back. Um, but, and of course, Damon, by the way, already has the contrary view to what I thought he was going to have, of course. But <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we'll have to hear what he says when he comes back. But, um, but no, I, I, I just, I hope that they do that stuff still. I hope that that's still, that not all that stuff is canceled or, you know, budget cuts or whatever out of Star Wars. I think you need to look at Pandora as a barometer for how that stuff's going to go. Because, um, if you think about when Pandora opened, like now there's, there's the, the drummers there. There's the guy in the, the mech suit that does the show, which we actually caught that when we were there too. Again. Um, so, so think of it the same way as, you know, when, when Pandora first opened, it was just Pandora. Like though it was talking about, you know, interactive stuff in the land or things beyond the fact that it was just Pandora. We're kind of in the same phase right now with uh, Galaxy's Edge is that, you know, yeah, they have the initial, the obvious stuff, you know, the stormtroopers and Chewie and stuff like that. But I really think once they get up to, to full speed on this thing, you're going to start hearing and seeing more of the stuff that they want to do. And yeah, it may be seasonal at the end of the day, because it, there may, again, there may be logistics reasons why they can't do it all year round. But I mean, from everything that I've seen so far, and it's funny, like you're talking about is, yeah, it feels like, you know, we, we've we been watching this so long and it, and you know, it just opened up in June and, you know, I spent a morning there and I'm talking like, yeah, you know, it's great. You know, I, I like <laughs> you're a resident of Batu. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm a pro I've been there. Right. But, but yeah, I feel that, you know, the next time I go back, I, I, I I can't imagine that Disney wouldn't, that they wouldn't want to continue to blow our socks off. Like they're, they're not going to let this thing stagnate with inside of a year. And I think a lot of that has to do with, it's not just about the, the visuals of it. It's the interactivity of it. And, and they are, they're fully aware of that. Like from everything that I saw just for the short amount of time that I was there, they are very big on making sure that it's a very immersive land so yeah, ho- hopefully this stuff will continue to happen 
as we go along. <laughs> no, I agree. I agree. And and along with that, so along with the 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 impending opening of Rise of Resistance, and and um, you know that'll be a couple of days after this podcast comes out that this ride is opening. And unfortunately, none of us get to be there for the opening. Damon's missing it by a day, which is killing him deep inside. Um, <laughs> it's really hurting his feelings, as Damon likes to say. Um, there is going to be uh, there's no been no extra magic hours announced yet for this, but they did adjust the operating hours of just basically every park. Um, like every single park is now open a little bit earlier and uh, a little bit later, it seems like. And, um, Hollywood studios itself is going to open at 8 a.m. uh, and close at 10 p.m. Uh, so it's a pretty long day there. But the interesting thing I find about this is that, um, as of right now, Rise of the Resistance is excluded from extra magic hours, um, as a, at the moment. So they're, they're saying that the, uh, uh, Rise of the Resistance will not be available for extra magic hours. And I, I think this is, not necessarily news. And the reason why I'm saying this is because it's a new ride that's super crazy complicated that they've already had to delay because it's so super crazy complicated and they've had, you know, issues getting it together. Obviously, once you get guests on that, you know, they've been testing it like crazy, but once you, you don't really know, you don't know what you don't know. Right. And so, and, and, you know, I know Trevor, you come from the, from the IT world, you know, you always plan all these things ahead of time. You test for every scenario, but until you get live people actually using it, you really can't know everything that's going to happen. And I think why they're leaving this out of mag- extra magic hours is they're going to need those extra hours in the morning or at night to really, uh, you know, fix whatever they need to fix, um, retrain however they need to retrain. Uh, you know, they, they need those extra hours. I don't think it's a, an indictment on the ride. I just think it's an, I, and I think it will be eventually added to extra magic hours. I just think it's, it's a situation where it's a brand new ride and they, they're going to need some time operationally to make sure that everything's working right. I agree with you, Tom, because you kind of look at Universal when they opened at Hagrid's coaster, the, just the motorbike coaster that just came up and they had a lot of problems with that to begin with. And it, it just got such a lot of, or it just got a lot of negative press initially because they had to shut it down to work on it in the morning. So it's probably not a bad move by Disney to not include it in the extra magic hours in the morning to give them time to make sure that the ride's running, you know, as best that they can initially. And can you guys hear that? I'm sorry about that. <laughs> and we, uh, when you live with teenagers, what? they're like upstairs above, just like doing something. Anyways, but. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have any of those teenager things. Oh, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> you will eventually. I will. That's true. Yes, I will. Yeah. <laughs> every every phase has its magic moments and uh, its downsides. Well, no, it's challenges. So let's put it that way. But I don't know. I think it's I think it's a good move on their part to be able to you know make sure the rides riding it or rides running the best that it can as people come in and really want to experience it. Yeah, and further to that, I also think that this is obvious expectation setting too because you know. If they're saying up front, don't assume that it will be extra magic hours because I can see, you know, there will be people that will pay for extra magic hours thinking that they're, you know, scooting around all the crazy lines for it and going, haha, you know, I'll, I'll go to extra magic hours and then, you know, it'll be quiet and I can ride it as much as I want. But like you said, if, if the ride's not functioning or if it breaks down, how many people would be absolutely livid that they paid for extra magic hours thinking that they were going to get onto this ride. And that was like their, the majority of their reason for booking extra magic hours. Yeah. And then, you know, being told, no, the, you're not getting on here. Yeah. So that's exactly right. That's a total, <laughs> that's a totally great point. Yeah. So I, I, I can see why they would do that. I mean, honestly, you know, even, even if I went to extra magic hours and it was like, Oh, you can't get on this one ride. I would be like, I don't care. There, you know, there's enough other stuff there now to do that. You know, one ride's not going to be a deal breaker, but for some people, you know, they have their heart set on it. And I, I can see that. I can see why, why Disney is just setting their expectations now. So they don't have to have that awkward conversation later. Yeah. And I mean, you know, it's interesting because with the, the Hagrid's thing, right, that, that was kind of disastrous because they started not even opening that ride to like noon. I think, I think if that happens with this ride, that Disney would be very disappointed. Like they don't want that to happen. That's like, there was a lot of bad press around that. Yeah. Yeah. And it's bad enough to, for, you know, people will come up during the day and say, you know, I paid for a park ticket and I expected this. And that's why they have all the disclaimers on the park ticket saying, you know, you know, don't expect everything to be open. So, and there's still people that, that have tried to push those boundaries in the past. So even further to that, having a special ticketed event and then people, 
you know, being in that same scenario, it just, it, it, it jacks it up another level where you, you know, you've got really upset people. And, and to me, that's just the obvious, it's a, it's just a, a customer expectation thing where you basically tell them, you know, you know, set the bar low and then that way they can't be disappointed. <laughs> well, this, you know, people still will be right. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. There, there will always be somebody, yeah. but you know, it, 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 it deals with, you know, 80 or 90% of the potential issues. <laughs> no, you're totally right. And uh, you know, it's interesting because I, I do wonder expectations are going to be different for this. Um, you know, it, it based on what happened with, with smugglers run, which has been, extraordinarily extraordinarily reliable right i mean we haven't heard i don't think i've heard once where everyone where someone was like oh that whole ride is down it's broken down and it's you know obviously because the way they designed it to have you know different individual uh you know chambers that you can go into uh so if one of them breaks there's still a bunch available but i mean we saw this with flight of passage when it first opened they had all sorts of problems with that ride right and 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 i think with this one you know they're gonna have similar problems it's it's inevitable there's there's only so much preparation you can do for this stuff and and i I think no matter what they do there's going to be breakdowns there's going to be problems there's going to be some issues with it and and that's just the way it's got to be and people have to have that expectation so anything else you guys want to talk about this before we go on to our cruise topic uh that i I put in here just for steve (laughs) yeah thanks for thanks for throwing me a softball on this one (laughs) it's pretty easy right yeah Yeah. (laughs) Anybody? Else, anything you guys want to mention though before we move on? No, I'm just. Oh. I'm really looking forward to. When are you, are you guys going to be down there to be able to do it anytime soon, or what? What's your guys' schedule like? <sighs> Gosh, uh, I wish I could be. Uh, I don't know the next time I'm going yet. I actually don't have a scheduled trip for 2020, which is crazy for me. Um, we're, we're my wife and I are discussing when it's going to happen. I, I mean, for sure, we're going to either by myself or with my wife, we're going to make it down for October 9th, which is when we're going to try to do our meet and greet with uh, listeners and everything uh, down there. So I am going to try to come then, but I don't know what other time we're going to come out. Uh, you know, we have annual passes that are good until June. So I kind of feel like we have to go again between now and June, but I don't know. We'll, we'll have to see, but I, unfortunately I won't be able to. So until at least October. Yeah. For me, October is already booked. So yeah, that'll be when I get to experience it. We're, he- we're heading down to Disneyland at the end of January, first part of February. So hopefully it's going to be up and running. And so right after it opens at yeah. yeah. Disneyland. Yeah. yeah, so we're hoping to finally – we haven't been to Galaxy's Edge yet, so that's going to be our first time there and just kind of experiencing the whole thing. So I'm hoping it's going to be up and running and, and not breaking down too much. And, and that'll be a good time <laughs> too because it'll be quiet. So Yeah, yeah. Well, maybe, you know, maybe a lot of people will be there because the rise, the rise of the resistance open, right? No, that's a good point. <laughs> but, all right. So I, you know, I wanted to, first of all, do we, do we want to ask Damon threw in a question here? And I, I actually didn't put it in the rundown here, but let me, let me, let me look it up really quick. J- Trevor, do you remember what Damon wanted us to ask him? <laughs> uh, let me find it here. But so I, I wanted to put this on here. I, I'm not going to lie. I don't know a lot about Disney Cruise Line. Um, but I did see this article about Disney Cruise Line guests can now book a placeholder cruise via the app, um, which I wanted to, I, I wanted to get your thoughts on. And also, you know, I don't know, how was it like previously? What was the process before? Is this a better process? It's, it's, it's not that big of a change to be completely honest. And, and the reason being, and I want to, I want to like throw Disney a, a bone here. You know, they kind of get beat down sometimes on their IT. I think the Disney cruise line app is pretty amazing. I've been on a couple other different cruise lines and or I've been on t- uh, Norwegian several times and the app that they have on board and they have both Disney and Norwegian and all the cruise lines have a chat feature now. The other cruise lines actually make you pay for it on a daily basis. You don't have to pay for it, but you do pay for it. And it doesn't work nearly as nice as Disney's. So what what Disney's really trying to do is put a lot of information on the app so you can kind of control everything from your smartphone as you're, as you're going around in your cruise. So beforehand, what they've done is they've added where you can book a placeholder. Well, what is a placeholder? That's when you're on a cruise, you can put down, um, right now it's $250 
towards another cruise. And then that gives you the benefit of getting 10% off that next cruise without having to decide it today. You don't have to decide, I want to do this Bahama cruise three months from now. You've got two years once you put that placeholder down to use it. And the way it used to work is there's a desk on deck four of the ships where you would go down and that's where you'd book a future cruise. Now you don't have to do that. To be honest, they kind of had a system set up where you could actually go in and just fill out a piece of paper and put it in a box so you didn't have to wait in line to 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 hand somebody a piece of paper. Now you don't even have to do that. You can just do that on the app itself. So it saves you some time. One of the things that they did add for people that are familiar with Disney Cruise Line, if you haven't been on there recently, is instead of having to go around and it used to be you'd see it like the first couple of days, nobody's really down there talking to the to the person working the future cruise desk. But by the end of the trip, they're just, everybody's just kind of standing on top of each other trying to take advantage of getting that 10% off their next booking. And now instead of having to lurk around and waste your time doing that, you can be out and about on the ship. On the app, you can put your name in and it'll put you in a virtual queue. And when it gets within about two or three people of you being to the top of the list, it'll give you an update saying, Hey, you're almost up. Come on down to the, to the desk. So it gives you an opportunity to, you know, not take time away from your cruise standing around waiting in line, I guess. So it's, I really like the Disney cruise line app. I think it's one of the few things that as far as it goes with Disney is just, it works really well. I agree with you that Disney it gets a bad rap, but (laughs) 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 I've, I've found that most things work very well. Most of the time, I, you know, I, I think, I think sometimes people, uh, you know, Get a, go a little too far, but I think they're constantly improving too. But you know, that's neither here nor there. But that's that's good to know, though. I think that's interesting. <laughs> yeah, hopefully, I, hopefully, I explained that well. But uh, oh, you explained it great. I, okay. I understand it now, and I didn't before. So yeah, so, and uh, they're adding. I'll just throw this out really quick too. This isn't quite working quite as well, but it'll you know it'll take time for them to work out some kinks. But you're just, they're trying to add for to give you the ability to text message people through the app now while you're on the ship. So either through kind of I think you can do it through Facebook and Twitter. You can send messages through Facebook message. I'm not sure about Twitter, but Facebook message or like if your iPhone just using the regular texting, that still isn't quite working perfectly yet, but I think I give it a, give it a, you know, a couple months, maybe a year and hopefully that'll be working well. So you'll be able to text people while you're on your cruise too. Yeah, I guess because service is kind of an issue when you're on the, the ship, isn't it? Yeah. So like yeah. in the, in airplanes, they use satellite Wi-Fi now. So when you're flying over the ocean, yeah. that's that's basically how everything talks. I, I got to imagine they're doing the exact same thing with the cruise ship. So it's probably just a matter of getting the system set up right to talk with the with the satellites or however they run. A, um, you might know better than I do, Trevor. Uh, not not in super detail, but yeah, it's uh, yeah, there it's there's a few different systems that they can utilize for uh, like that satellite type internet, but. Uh, yeah, honestly, I haven't looked into it too much for the cruises because, uh, like, like we said, you know, my my wife will probably never get on a cruise boat, so <laughs> so I just don't spend a lot of energy looking at it. Um, so as, as far as the the booking the cruises go, I, I didn't realize they actually had something like that. I guess for for people that weren't aware of it, it's kind of like the uh, the bounce back offers if you uh, if you get a room on uh, on cash at the at Disney World. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. Oh, yeah. 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 It sounds like the same, same type of system, but then, yeah, they've just, they've just further upped it to, you know, use the virtual queue. Like they, they've started using at galaxy's edge and whatever. So. Yeah. And if, it, if I mean, and that's the best way, if you want to cruise, you know, again and again with Disney, the best way to get your cheapest price is book opening day. So when those, those next, which is usually about a year and a half out from your cruise, book that day if you don't happen to be on the ship which is what are the chances of that if you've got that onboard booking that you've bought through the app then at that opening day you're going to get 10 percent off of that opening day price which that's probably about the best that you can do as far as trying to save money on a cruise yeah i was gonna say that i think that from what damon said that that's pretty substantial like get it get it in as early as possible and then get the 10 percent discount yeah, because they, they don't come back down in price. It's kind of longer, long under the days and it's a whole, you could do a whole podcast on, on pricing and cruises to be completely honest. But <laughs> and Disney's even in its own or Disney Cruise Line's in, even in its own little niche because there's only four ships and supply and demand. So yeah, the prices just don't come down anymore like they used to. And even the bigger cruise lines with the, with the more ships are kind of running things the same way. Whereas your best price is generally going to be 
at the opening pricing of those cruises. I, uh, I, I saw Steve, I don't know if you've been watching the Imagineering story on Disney plus, but I, I saw the, the, just the most recent episode that came out this past Friday. And, uh, there was a pretty decent section about the creation of, uh, Disney cruise line on there, which was uh, pretty interesting. Yeah. We, I've heard about it and it's killing me because I haven't even seen episode one of the Imagineering story. And I really, oh. really want to see oh. that. So oh. <laughs> gotta watch it. It's so good. <laughs> We've been watching the Mandalorian. So, uh, well, yeah, well, yeah, that's good too. <laughs> yeah. But, um, I, I think Imagineering story actually is my favorite thing so far on Disney plus, but that's just me. I, I mean, I like the Mandalorian too, but I, I, Imagineering story is just hitting hitting a certain place with me that is uh I, I i can't wait to see every episode so and i'm sad that there's only a couple more so i kind of feel like i'm saving it right now i want to savor it a little bit for some reason i can't wait to watch can it binge though. it exactly yeah, I, th- I think that's a good like <laughs> christmas holidays kind of like just sit down and watch it in your pajamas <laughs> oh yeah yeah for sure but it was there was definitely some interesting stuff about disney cruise line in there so yeah kind of the origins of it and where it came from it's an, it's an interesting yeah. story so yeah, there's uh, this this last step. They've been very candid on the on the show about their failures and their successes. I, I've actually been a little surprised about it because I I really expected it to be a um, you know, a, a Disney corporate version of, of everything's great it, and wonderful. Yeah, everything's <laughs> yeah, you know, uh, fairy tales and you know, rainbows and puppy dogs. But it it really hasn't been that. It's been like, hey, uh, we really uh, screwed up on California Adventure and. Um, you know, we also really cheaped out on Hong Kong and, uh, <laughs> you know, like it's, it's funny how, how they're really being, uh, honest about it, uh, and allowing that. I, I, I'm glad, I'm glad they're doing it that way though. It's, it's, you know, it, it lends to the credibility of it. Cause if they were just saying that everything's great, we're the best, like, <laughs> I think that would be, uh, disingenuous. So, but you should check it out, Steve. It's, it's a good episode and, and really, I, I mean, it's not a, it's not the whole episode about Disney Cruise Line, but there's, there's a good amount in there. Yeah. No, I'm looking forward to it. And then after that, I got to start working on Trevor to get him and his wife on a cruise and. <laughs> Oh, I'm, I'm all in. I'm going. I'm just waiting for my daughter to get a little older. You got to work on Trevor though. That's going to be tougher. Yeah. Like, like I said, we'll, we'll probably talk more adventures by Disney than, than the cruise, but I, I would be more, I would be down to talk adventures by Disney with you. Yeah. I think, I, I think, uh, you know, cruises are different things, you know, like you get out of the Caribbean in my mind, that's kind of a beach vacation. So, but if you want to do a little, a little history, you can get a little bit of that. If you go over to Europe, if you can, if that's in your budget to, you know, like do a Mediterranean cruise, especially the Baltics, you get to go to some pretty amazing places like St. Petersburg and see a lot of history up there. So that's kind of what we kind of gravitate towards. We kind of like those cruises where you get to see that type of history and, but then you get back on and it's, it's an easy evening worth where the kids are going to eat something and you can both everybody go out, have, have a little bit of fun in the evening as well. So that's why we it's, like it. It's more of an experience than a relaxing vacation. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. No, I get that. <laughs> so I, I did find Damon's question. We should, we should ask him yes. this question. Yeah. Do you, do you want to ask or do you want me to? Try? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll read it here. So, uh, okay. So, so what Damon says is, uh, we have a choice of Hawaii or a cruise for our kids' high school graduation. What would you do and why would you, and what cruise would, would you suggest? Alaska is off the table, but they're thinking the timing would be in June. But also not till 2022. So new ships are in play is what he said. Right. Oh yeah. Right. Yeah. That's oh that man. That's, that's a tough one there. Has he been to Hawaii before? Don't know. Don't know. Okay. <laughs> I don't think he has. He's never I, talked I, about I, it. I seem to remember him not have gone going there before. Yeah. yeah that, that's a, that's a tough one. Um, and for you, is the grant for graduation to, you know, my, my kids are, are older. They do, or my oldest is 13 going on 14. He's, he's had a blast on the cruise ships. He's made friends. They've gone out and run around while you're on the ship itself. And then we have a lot of fun in port. Oh, geez. I don't, I would probably say if you were going to do it, if you're going to try and do something comparable to Hawaii and you're not going to go to Alaska, and you're not going to go to Europe and do Europe. If you're going to do something in the Caribbean and you want to do something like that, look for either one of the eight or nine day cruises that the Disney fantasy does down to the Southern Caribbean. We're going to get to go to a lot more islands. You're going to get to do, have a lot more opportunities to do different things on those, those islands. And you're going to have an, I know he's been on cruises before, so he's, he's familiar with cruises like, you know, an eight or nine days not going to affect him too much. I, w- I would do something like that to make it comparable to Hawaii if you're gonna, if you're not going to do Hawaii but that would be my my guess or that would be my uh what I would steer him towards 
let me ask you this. Are there, are there any, there's, are there any Disney Cruise Line ships that go out of Hawaii or go to Hawaii where he could do both? So they do have, they only run them every now and then. Actually, they are running one this spring. So the Wonder, so there's four ships, two small ones, the Magic and the Wonder, and then the Fantasy and the Dream are the, the larger ships right now. The Wonder comes over to the West Coast, does some Mexico sailings, and goes up to Alaska. And this year, it is going to make a run out to Hawaii. It doesn't happen every year, but they're doing it this year. You know, that's a tough one, too, because you're going to spend three, I think it's three or four sea days, which... We love sea days, but you can spend three or four sea days before you get to Hawaii, and then it's quick around the islands there. So if you really want to immerse yourself in Hawaii, you don't get as much of it because three three of the days are spent at sea getting you there. So that it goes out once, or it goes from Vancouver to uh, Honolulu and around the islands, and then um, it, everybody gets off, and then the next crew cruise, it get, everybody gets on at Honolulu, goes around the islands a little bit, and then back to Vancouver. So... Um, yeah, I think if you wanted to do Hawaii, I think I would just go to Hawaii. I've heard Alani's amazing. So I've always, I, I definitely have a goal of, I, I want to do a trip where we go to, go to Disneyland for a couple of days and then go to Alani for a couple of days and then, you know, head back at, you know, or, or, you know, four or five days in Alani and four or five days in, you know, Disneyland. Um, that's something that, that I have a dream of doing at some point. Again, once my daughter is older and can appreciate the magnitude of that kind of trip for us. So, but, um, yeah, that's, that's great advice. That sounds, you know, sounds good. Yeah. If he, if he wants to talk it over, have him text me or email me or whatever else. I can throw some more things in his way. If he has any other questions. Uh, yeah, de- definitely. Definitely. So, uh, so great. Uh, so we talked a little bit about cruising. That's great. Um, I, you know, we do have some more, uh, we're kind of running out of time here. So what I want to skip over, uh, I did have some stuff about space 220 on here. We've been talking about space 220 for a while. Um, it's a, the most excited, the thing I'm most excited about for the, for the Epcot stuff over the next year or so is space 220. I'm super psyched for this restaurant. Um, and we'll, really quickly cover this so we can go on to the Disneyland topics. Cause I think there's some interesting Disneyland stuff, but um, basically we've been saying for a while and Disney said that they were going to open this restaurant by the end of the year. Uh, they lost their head chef. Uh, so that I think delayed things a little bit. Now they're looking to February of 2020 uh, and, and they're posting some jobs for that. And also it's being reported to that. They're going to serve breakfast, lunch, and dinner, which I think is also interesting. Um, you know, that they're going to have all three meals there, especially with the abundance of, of, of different food options at, at Epcot. But, um, if you guys have anything, any thoughts about that, we can, we can talk about it briefly, but, uh, if not, we can move on to the next stuff. Any thoughts on space 2020? Uh, not I 2020, 220. God, 220. I'm going to do that forever. <laughs> you can see it clearly. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, I, 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 don't care until it's op- until I'm there in October, and it better be open by the time I'm there in October. <laughs> I think it will. <laughs> yeah, I'm excited to see how they uh, use the technology and what you're going to be able to see while you're sitting at the table. I'm curious yeah. as to what how they're going to kind of entertain you a little bit as you're looking out into space. I'm sure it's going to be more than just stars. I would hope so. I, 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 my my assumption is there's going to be like events happening. And what I mean by events, you know, if you've ever gone to like Rainforest Cafe, every once in a while there's like a thunderstorm that rolls through and there's like things that happen. I'm assuming there's going to be stuff that regularly happens, right? Space gorillas. Space gorillas. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, for some reason, you just made me think of like the aliens from The Simpsons, like one of them just floating by for some reason, like <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> just randomly. Yeah. I don't know. It'd be weird. St- weird stuff would be funny. <laughs> yeah. I would All right, so it. let's talk about these yeah. Disneyland things because I think these are interesting, and especially since you guys are both uh, really, really Disneyland guys, and uh, these things don't—I'm um, not going to say they don't interest me all that much, but they—they—they they, um, they do. But um, you know, I don't—I don't know what these things are like now because I haven't been there. So uh, at the same time, I'm not like attached to what what everything looks like now. So, uh, Trevor, do you want to talk about the uh, new Tomorrowland entrance? Yeah, so they're, they're doing a pretty big revamp of Tomorrowland. Uh, for, for those that have been there in its current state, it's very bronze looking. Like it doesn't look at all like the one in, in Disney World. Um, there's a lot of bronze and kind of, it was supposed to be like a, I don't know if they were going for like steampunk or something like that with the look, but they're, 
they've removed they, they call them the french fry rocks you know what i'm talking about steve right oh yeah the, those yeah, yeah that yeah that the, they had these weird rocks that they look kind of like french fries and, and so that's all been pulled out i guess and this new concept art it it looks beautiful like i i do want to go back just to see this well, and the the other thing, when I kind of thinking about it too, they've got Pixie Hollow to the left, which always kind of seems sort of weird because you're like yeah. looking at Future World, and they kind of put Pixie Hollow there to the left, and they've kind of changed the topiary around a little bit, so you don't really see that now. So it's more of kind of that futuristic look as you walk in, and they've got the rocket ships, and then everything behind it. Yeah, yeah, you're right. I, I, because I, I always attributed that to just you know Fantasyland and Tomorrowland are kind of. Like they do kind of blend together on the edges, but, uh, yeah, Pixie Hollow is definitely mashed in there. But yeah, these, these new gardens and everything, I, I think it's a, it's a much nicer, like that retro, um, sixties futurism, I guess is what they're kind of going back to. Yeah. Just, I mean, just the coloring, like you're talking about, I'm looking at the pictures right now. It's kind of, it, it, you definitely have that more maybe Jules Verne kind of look at it rather than the steampunk. I don't know. Does that make sense? What I'm saying? Yeah. Um, yeah. It's look. just a uh, cleaner, like, like steampunk seems a little dirty. This looks a lot cleaner. Yeah, right? yeah. 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 So no, I'm excited for it. I think, I think this will be a good, you know, addition to, to the land and kind of maybe trying to give it a little bit of a direction. It seems like it, it's kind of lost itself over time. And like, once again, you could do a whole podcast on future world and what, how hard it is to kind of keep up with futuristic things and make it relevant. But I, I really like what they're doing here from the picture and the concepts that they're coming out with. The Tomorrowland problem. Yeah. S- sadly, yes, yes. sadly, no talk of the people mover though, but uh, I, yeah. They speaking of people mover, they had a little a little blip about the rocket rods in the uh, in that last Imagineering story episode. Yeah, that's that's a that one stings for me because I did actually get to ride the people mover before it became rocket rods. So did you get to ride the rocket rods? <laughs> no, I was I wasn't there when they. Uh, the, it was open for so short of a time because when I was a kid, we would go once every five years. So it from. I went once on the people mover and then the next time I went back, it was just gone altogether. So. And we never had an opportunity to ride those either. So I I missed out on that as well. Yeah. It's there's an interesting little section about that. And I actually, uh, it's funny. I was watching it and I was like, Oh, they're going to talk about the rocket rods. I just saw it coming. (laughs) (laughs) You knew, (laughs) but they didn't talk about it for that long. But I mean, it was kind of them talking about, you know, that they, they do fail. I mean, they, they fail on stuff sometimes. So, (laughs) um, but I I am interested about this snow white, scary adventure change that's happening. I, I, I don't know. Like for me, outsider looking in, as far as Disneyland people go, it feels like the Disneyland uh, people feel a little less attached to some of the things. Meaning, like Tower of Terror, when they changed it, it didn't seem like there was an uproar like there would be in Florida. But this is a classic ride that's been there, you know, forever. So, um, for those that don't know, um, Trevor, why don't you do it? Since I'm sorry, I, I'm I'm jumping in on this. Go, ahead, Trevor. You talk. Yeah, no, it's, it's so they're doing a major overhaul to Snow White Scary Adventure. So for for those that have uh, written it. The, the final scene that it, it's very disjointed in its current form and they're actually adding a happily ever after ending to it. So, so what happens now, and, and I'm sure you've probably seen this, Steve is, uh, you're you, like, you're following the story and then it's like, you come around a corner and it goes from like the, the dwarves fighting with the, the queen And it just goes to, and they lived happily ever after. Like there's no in between of how did they get from fighting with her to, you know, what happened. So I, it it sounds like they're redoing the timing of the ride and, and, and they're taking this opportunity to just revamp the whole flow of the ride so that it actually does make sense again. (laughs) Yeah. It almost felt like they ran out of track space or something like that where like they just couldn't fit the whole story in there. Yeah, that, and, and it was, cause it, the, the latest, or the, the current version of it, they, I, I remember they said they did it back, it was either in the late 80s or the early 90s, where they, they, it got an overhaul, and yeah, it felt like somebody, somebody was like, oh, you know, let's do, like, like they had it all laid out, and then they realized that they didn't have enough track to do everything they wanted to do, so they just, stopped (laughs) they were just like and we're done (laughs) and they happily lived ever after yeah yeah 
<laughs> yeah, so, and, so you guys don't see this as a negative change. This is a good no, thing. No, no. Uh, the the ride right now is it, it's humorous to ride because it, they call it Snow White Scary Adventure. But like you know, you get the ride starts off. You know, for kids it would be very intense. But then, like I've seen people come off of that ride and be confused. Like it, it goes very quickly from like, oh, that was scary or that was intense to like, what just happened? Like <laughs> it's and so yeah, the, there is definitely a problem with the way the ride is is done right now, and I'm glad that they actually acknowledge that and that they're they're trying to make it better. <laughs> Are they changing the name on it too? I'm trying to trying to look at it. Are they going to keep the scary adventure seem, part? Yeah, yeah it doesn't seem like they're changing it. Okay, so it's just the ending itself. So all right, yeah. Well, and they're changing. They're adding new music, LED black lighting, laser projections, a new animation system, and then they're refurbing the entire outside of the attraction. So. So I I feel that when they say animation system, you you've been on uh, Alice in Wonderland since they did the update to it, right, Steve? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I I, I feel we're going to see a lot of that kind of stuff where they where they use the uh, like the the animation scenes from the movie and stuff in various points, which I think I think the Alice in Wonderland upgrades were fantastic. So yeah, it kind of takes a you know that nineteen sixties technology and, and brings it into the future a little bit, and I, I like it. Yeah. too. it kind of adds to the storytelling, and I know my kids like it too. When they for, I remember when we for, when they were younger and they first went on, I don't think they made it made much of a difference. We don't go on these rides quite as much as we used to anymore, but because like our kids have gotten a little bit older, but they they really like that animation sequence that they added into Alice in Wonderland. Yeah, my son, his first experience was, uh, um, the first time we took him was right after they had added that in. So he did, he never knew what the ride was like before, but he does kind of have a, a barometer for comparison because he's been on Mr. Toad and all that. And he kind of knows what the old versus the new rides are. I was just so, going to bring out Mr. Toad. I think that's the only one that they haven't touched yet. So. Yeah. Which I, honestly, I, I feel like they shouldn't at this point. Yeah. But, yeah. Kind of keep a little bit of history there and, yeah. and what it was like when it first started. So yeah, I agree with you there. I love, I yeah. love Mr. Toads. And, and the fact that we lost it in, uh, in Florida, like if they, yeah. if they touched it at this point, I think people would be really upset about it. <laughs> See, it's funny because when I first read this article, my first thought was like, oh, people are going to be mad. You're like, cause that's what always happens anytime they change anything minor and even like minor stuff that they change at Disney World. Like people are mad. Like even like a lot of people hate the current figment right right mm-hmm. but even if they got rid of that people there there's gonna be a segment of people that are gonna be mad about it right um even though uh, most people agree that that it's you know that ride is not great uh but <laughs> it seems like everyone is cool with this like everyone's like oh yeah this, this is great they'd make a little change to the ending and and, and we're good I think like Trevor said, you know, it, by putting kind of an end, like an ending that you can actually follow, I think that's going to really add a lot to it. So I think maybe that's something that people kind of look at and get, and maybe give them a little leeway on this one and not stand their ground and say, don't change it. Yeah. I, I think it's kind of in that space, like, like the whole figment thing or the imagination pavilion. Um, that was a change where, it, yeah, nobody asked for it and it came out as a negative. This, I think, is on the same level as, um, the, um, what's it called? The, the movie star limos is what it was originally called oh, being super, turned. Su- super super star star limo. Limo. Super <laughs> star? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You know, that getting turned into Monsters Inc. It's like, like everybody at this point knows, you know, Snow White is, it's still Snow White, but yeah, it, it has some fundamental problems. So. I don't think, I think a lot of people look as go, well, there's really nowhere to go but up on this one. <laughs> well, that's, that's good then. I'm, I'm glad. I, you know, I think it's good that when they write some wrongs, you know, uh, I, I think the only way that people would be okay with them changing the figment, right? If they, if they just change it back to the original, I think then everybody would be like, great. Cause like nobody disliked the original. Everybody loved the original, right? But I don't know. Who knows? Yeah. I, I like the current one, but I'm probably in the I minority. Do. So <laughs> no, I do too. We ride it every time. We enjoy the ride, but most people seem to hate it. I I don't know. I I like it. I but I also like Stitch's Great Escape too. So I, I mean, we're, we're you know, it's we like everything. We <laughs> that, we don't dislike anything. Yeah, I I like the only yeah actually yeah I can't think of a single ride that I would actively say that I hate. Although when the Tiki Room was under new management, I wasn't a fan of. That. <laughs> Yeah, I don't think anybody liked that, right? That, yeah. that nobody liked that one. Yeah, I, I feel there was some karma with the building being struck by lightning there. 
Yeah, I think so. That was that was Walt striking the building down. <laughs> Sorry, Steve. Go ahead. No, 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 no. I was, I was thinking of. Uh, have you guys ever? Well, have you been at Goofy Sky School there, Trevor? Yeah, I, think I, I like that. You like that one? <laughs> that, <Yeah. laughs> that top part when you get to the top and you just go the, back, the and, back forth. and forth. <laughs> yeah, I feel like you're just going to go flying off. And I mean, I don't hate that ride at all, but my kids love it. And that's probably the one ride I've ridden enough that I don't need to ever go on that one again, but we will, <laughs> we'll be on it again. <laughs> yeah. I think that's the thing with it is, I mean, it's, it's a fun, it reminds me of just like a good carnival coaster, yeah. which I, I always liked. But yeah, my kid, he thinks the back and forth is hilarious. Yeah. So. It, it is a fun ride. I, I don't want to, yeah. I don't want to test on it whatsoever. It is a fun ride, but I was trying to think like, oh, I'm with you guys. There's not a bad ride really in all the places that we've been. We've, we've enjoyed them all for the, they all have their good, good points to it. Yeah. Primeval world. <laughs> I, that's, that's a crowd favorite for in my house. That you guys like that one? That's, yeah. that's a favorite. Uh, yeah, it is. I, I, was I, I like it too. I, I, I'm not going to lie. I do like it too, but I, I could see, I know some people don't like that one either. <laughs> It's really like my, again, my wife won't ride it because it spins, but mm. yeah, I think it's great. <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah. Well, okay. Well, great. I, anything else we want to talk about before we, we wrap this thing up? I think we're, we're right at our time here. And, and I, I think this, uh, this has been great. This has been great to have Steve on. And, uh, anything else you guys want to talk about with Disneyland though before we wrap this thing up? No, I don't have anything. I just want to thank you guys for letting me come on today. It's it's been a lot of fun. I really appreciate the the podcast you guys put together. It's fun to listen to you guys every week when it comes out, and it's been a lot of fun just you know sitting back and talking all different parts of DVC Disneyland and little Disney Cruise Line as well. Sure. Yeah. Thanks so much for joining us, Steve. It was it was great having you. Yeah, it was awesome. Yeah, for sure. And and can you tell everybody again too where they can where they can find your your show? Yeah, any anywhere podcasts are, you can find us if you want to learn a little bit more about Disney Cruise Line. We're the DCL Podcast. You can reach us on Facebook at DCL Podcast, and I'm on Twitter as well. If anybody's on Twitter out there at DCL Podcast, so just reach out, and we have a lot of fun talking about all different kinds of things. Disney Cruise Line Adventures by Disney. So, we if you want to come and check us out, we'd love to have you. Great. All right, Trevor, you want to uh, take us home here? For sure. All right. So, uh, if you have any questions or comments or anything you want to ask us about, uh, what you heard on this episode, you can email us at welcomehomepodcast at gmail.com. Uh, again, we love hearing from you guys or, you know, if anyone who's met Damon, if you got, you know, if you want to relay stories or, or whatever, you know, let us know. We, we've been hearing or we've been hearing part of the conversation, but then of course, when you guys meet up, you know, Damon doesn't tell us anything because he's busy. <laughs> I, I want to know the impression that people have when they meet him. That's what I want to know. Cause yeah. they, like we've joked about before that Damon's a ghost and he doesn't, he doesn't share anything. So I want to know what people thought about their interaction with Damon. I'm sure they had a great time because Damon's a great guy and fun to be around, but, uh, I just want to know. I want to hear more details. Yeah, for sure. And, uh, and as far as social media goes, you guys can find us on Facebook as uh, Welcome Home Podcast. Uh, you can also subscribe to us on Twitter and Instagram. Uh, Twitter is Welcome Home Pod. Instagram is Welcome Home Picks. Uh, uh, those just mirror our Facebook if you want to just see the, the posts of, you know, stuff or pictures and stuff that we talk about. Uh, if you're interested in some Welcome Home Podcast merchandise, you can go to store.welcomehomepodcast.com. Uh, Get yourself a, a magnet or a mug or a t-shirt or something. I actually, uh, I grabbed some magnets for myself and they're pretty nice. So, cool. um, check those out. And, yeah, and uh, also the Facebook group too. Uh, welcome, uh, what is it? Welcome home DVC members is our Facebook group. Yes. Yeah. That's right. It's, uh, yeah. Um, obviously, you know, Damon's been posting in there on his trip. I was posting in there on my trip. Uh, we have lots of fun conversations in there. You know, people, we ask questions to our listeners. People ask stuff back and forth. You guys have been sharing, um, your experiences and, and j yeah, it's, it's great. You know, it's, it's a great group where, uh, where I think we all just, uh, love to talk Disney and it's, uh, no drama. So yeah, drama free so far. Yeah. That, that's the good thing too, is we, we, we do not encourage the drama because we all want it to be a fun place. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And, uh, the only other thing is, uh, if you guys found us on iTunes or Spotify or play or anything like that, um, we do like reviews and we, we do enjoy reading the reviews, um, good and bad. Um, obviously we, we like to try and improve ourselves. And also if you're liking the, the podcast, we love hearing that. It also helps, uh, make the podcast more visible too, so that more people can find us in the future. 
Yeah, and uh, of course, don't forget to subscribe to Malcolm Home Podcast so you can be reminded every time we release a new episode. Uh, you can find us on Apple Podcasts, Google Play Music, Google Podcasts, TuneIn, Stitcher, Spotify, anywhere you can find podcasts, you can find us. Just search for Welcome Home uh, and look for the one that says Disney and DVC. Uh, just a reminder to our listeners, as always, uh, Welcome Home Podcast is for entertainment only. We are not employed by the Walt Disney Company, and as such, any and all opinions we express on this show are our own. So, and if you have any questions about anything we talked about today, consult the dvc representative uh call you know disney directly talk to a cast member and get more information big thank you to dvc rental store for sponsoring this episode uh great partner to have and uh you know please check them out if you have any uh rental needs uh they are a great company to work with of course join us next time for more disney parks discussion more dvc talk Big thanks to Steve from DCL Podcast for joining us today. Please check out that podcast if you're you're interested in uh, Disney Cruise Line or, or anything with uh, Adventures by Disney. Uh, and, you know, of course, again, as always, we hope to see you all real soon. This is Skipper Albert Awal, the voice of the jungle, signing off from Welcome Home Podcast on the DVC. When we hit a chair, how she can cuddle is no affair. I looked around from pole to pole, found her in a sugar bowl.